dating nila dito, talagang nangangailangan sila. Hapong hapo, gutong na gutong, uhaw na uhaw. Kung hindi tinakain ng ating mga ninuno, yung mga namamatay na na Tony na Magella, wala sana tayong pinag-uusapan na first circumnavigation of the world, na achievement ng siyensya at ng uh, sangkatauhan. Binisita sila ng taga-suluan ng Magellan Expedition and there were exchange gifts. Y yun ang ngayon ang sinisilibrate ng humanity in Pumonhon. Hindi pinakain. Ang description ni Pigafetta, 1,500 na taga-makan aming from three sides. So talagang ginamita ng talino at strategiya ng ating mga ninuno si Magellan. Ngayon, nagkakaroon tayo ng reorientation and refocusing ng ating kasaysayan kung saan inabalikan natin ang ating kasaysayan sa lente o sa vista ng mga sarili nating mga manunularin ng historiador. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the maiden production of the newly restored Metropolitan Theater, Lapu Lapu, Ang Datu ng Maktad. years, Filipinos have fought for freedom, unity, and equality. 
We have made our mark in many fields, from science and medicine to culture and the arts. We are beacons of creativity and equality, resourcefulness, resiliency, and compassion. In 2021, the Filipino people will join the world in commemorating one of the greatest achievements of mankind, the first circumnavigation of the world. We celebrate this historic achievement by bannering an important message. Over adversity and struggles, we shall triumph, putting humanity first. Always. We celebrate this historic achievement by bannering an important message. Over adversity and struggles.
recovery of the Philippines by Ferdinand Magellan in March 1521. For centuries, the Eurocentric viewpoint created an impression that prior to Magellan's arrival, our ancestors were nothing but savage and civilized people. The 500th anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the world milestone is seen by the Philippine government as an opportunity to dispel the myths and misconceptions about the Filipinos through history and as a platform so that the world knows that the Filipino people are one with the world in fostering unity and magnanimity. Along with the said milestone is the 500 years of the victory of Lapu Lapu and his warriors in the Battle of Mactan. An event that serves as among the inspirations for our heroes and martyrs during the Philippine Revolution of 1896 and of the subsequent events that led to the formation of the Filipino nation, the first democracy in Asia. Speaking of the first democracy in Asia, which is the Philippines, this is the reason why the NQC chose the Emilio Aguinaldo Shrine as a symbolic host of the Philippine International Kitsitino Conference. To know more about Aguinaldo Shrine, let's watch this special feature produced for us by the Radio Television Manahay. 123 years ago, the Filipino nation assembled here in this very house in Kawit, Cavite to proclaim to the world the independence of the Philippines. Ago, this the Filipino nation assembled here years in this very Spanish colonization since 1565. To proclaim but to the world our founders the looked back even further to 1521, the, the year our ancestors in Mactan, led by Lapu Lapu, triumphantly defended our homeland and dignity against the intrusion of Ferdinand Magellan. When the document proclaiming Filipino independence was read in a window of this house on June 12, 1898, at 4.20 p.m., Lapu Lapu and Mactan were invoked. This reminded those who came on the occasion that they had a victorious past. That window was improved by Emilio Aguinaldo, the then president of the Philippines and the owner of this house, and converted it to what is now a grand balcony. At this spot, the tricolor Philippine flag was unfurled to the tune of a triumphant march. That flag and song became our national flag and national anthem. We salute and sing with pride and respect today. Because of the role of Gawit in the elevation of Lapu Lapu and Mactan as national glories, the Philippine government, through the National Kitsitino Kitsitino, chose to hold here the inaugural session of the Philippine International Kitsitino Conference, or PIQC. PIQC is part of the celebrations of the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan and the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world, collectively known as the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines. Above us is the ceiling with an iconic 8 great sun in our national flag. This actually sets the record straight that the meaning of the rays of the sun pertains to the provinces surrounding Manila City under the state of war or martial law on August 30, 1896, namely Manila Province, Cavite, Bulacan, Pampanga, Tarla, Nueva Ecija, Laguna, and Batangas. Evident in the PIQC logo are the two representations of the eight rayed suns. The right side features the sunlight 16th century Visayan tattoo pattern with an interval of eight rays found in the Boxer Codex, while the other half bears the sun motif of the compass ropes often seen in early European maps. The two intersect with one another, highlighting the contacts of our ancestors with the Spaniards five the representation of Inang Bayan, or motherland, is also depicted on the ceiling. She is dressed in Filipino women's clothing at that time. 
grasping on one hand the national flag the and a broken Bayan chain on the other to symbolize freedom and independence. In Below her is a small carabao head, which is an allegory of a typical Philippine native scene. Carabao is also a motif below the balcony of the house. Below her is a small carabao Aside from being the shrine of Philippine independence, the Aguinaldo Shrine is home to Emilio Aguinaldo Museum. It is one of the 27 history museums under the management of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines or NHCP. It features the life and times of Aguinaldo and his ancestral home until his death in 1964. In his last will and testament, Aguinaldo declared he was donating the entire mansion, including its contents and surrounding structures and vicinity to the Filipino people. It was first managed by the National Museum of the Philippines and later by the NHCP. It was also here in Kami that the political meeting of Filipino officially came into being and fought for in the events that succeeded. The proclamation of Philippine independence is essential in defining Filipino in the Filipino viewpoint of Philippine history. And Lapu-Lapu and Mactan are undeniably part of the heritage shared by the Filipinos, not only by Cebuanos and Visayans. These are the glories of the Filipino people. Maraming salamat at mabuhay! You have just seen the significance of the Emilio Aguinaldo Shrine, not only as the birthplace of the Philippine nation and Asia's first democracy, but also the site where the founders of the Filipino evoked the memory of Lapu Lapu and the Battle of Mactan of 15 and 21. Truly, the events from 500 years ago are among the inspirations and sources of pride of the Philippine Lapu the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference will run for two months from October 20 to December 17, 2021. It is divided into 13 sessions and further subdivided into 38 panels for a total of 100 hours. We are expecting 39,000 participants or an average of 3,000 participants per session inside the Zoom webinar powered by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. According to the NQC Secretariat, the webinar slots are distributed to our basic education schools, higher education institutions, public information offices, and tourism and culture offices across the 17 regions of the Philippines to the Department of Education, Commission on Higher Education, Department of Tourism, Philippine Information Agency, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Webinar slots are also given to the Department of Foreign Affairs for 87 Foreign Service posts and their diplomatic partners. Historians from the provinces are also represented in the conference through the NHCP Local Historical Committee's Network. A certain percentage of the webinar slots is open to the public through random selection. A certificate of participation shall be given to a webinar room participant who has completed a session, which the NQC Secretariat will monitor the webinar slots. To those who will not be able to enter the webinar rooms, you can still watch the proceedings anytime, anywhere, in over 100 Facebook pages, especially the Facebook page of the National Quincentennial Committee at NTC 2021. You may also watch it the channel of the National Quincentennial Committee on the PIPC or Philippine International Quincentennial Conference Portal that is www.ntc.com.ph PIPC. The remaining months of 2021 will be busy and flooded with information. Here is the schedule you need to remember.
from now, we shall hear the messages from our esteemed speakers. Dr. René R. Escalante, the chairperson of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and concurrently the executive director of the National Quincentennial Committee, the and he is also the chief convener of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. Honorable Teodoro Luxin Jr., the Foreign Affairs Secretary of the Republic of the Philippines. Honorable Augusto Santos Silva, Foreign Minister of the Portuguese Republic. Honorable Jose Manuel Alvarez Bueno, Foreign Minister of the Kingdom of Spain. Executive Secretary Salvador C. Medialdea, the Chairperson of the Philippine National Quincentennial Committee, and the one to introduce the Philippine President, Rodrigo Roa Duterte, who will also deliver a message. Owing to the pandemic, the messages of the Foreign Ministers, Executive Secretary, and President Duterte will be given virtually. We would also like to acknowledge that the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference is funded by the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day Funds. We are also thankful for the support of House Deputy Speaker Loren Legarda and Office of Senator Juan Edgardo Angara. We shall now proceed to the program proper inside the Aguinaldo Shrine. It will be hosted by Ms. Carel Dabu of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. We will be back after the opening program. We would like to acknowledge the presence of Executive Secretary Salvador C. Miguel Dea, the Chairperson of the Philippine National Quincentennial Committee, and the one to introduce Philippine President Rodrigo Roma Duterte, who will also deliver his message. Dr. René R. Escalante, the Chairperson of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and concurrently the Executive Director of the National Quincentennial Committee. He is also the chief convener of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. Honorable Chidoro Luxin Jr., the Foreign Affairs Secretary of the Republic of the Philippines. The Honorable Augusto Santos Silva, Foreign Minister of the Portuguese Republic. The Honorable Jose Manuel Alvarez Bueno, Foreign Minister of the Kingdom of Spain. And Ms. Carminda R. Arevalo, Officer in Charge of the Office of the Executive Director, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. As we proceed with this program, please stand for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem to be led by Mr. Ruel Masata, to be followed by a prayer entitled, A Historian's Prayer, written by Xiao Tuwa, to be read by Ms. Leon Aldea of Emilio Aguinaldo Museum. Bayang magiliw, perlas ng silanganan Alab ng puso, sa dibdim mo'y buhay Lupang hinirang, buyan ka ng magiting Sa manlulupig, di ka pasisiil Sa dagat at bundok, sa simoy at sa langit mong bughaw May nilagang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal Isap ng watawat mo'y tagumpay na nagliningning Ang bituin at araw ng intaynan Pag may di magdidilim Lupa ng araw ng luwal Hatid pagsinta Buhay ay langit sa piling mo Aming ligaya na pag may mga api Ang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo Lord of history, we humble ourselves to you in this critical time for our country. Thank you for the gift of knowing our mother country through our history, because it is only in knowing her that we can truly love her. Thank you for the realization that history is not just about the great personages who created and led the nation, but also about the people from the margins whose blood, sweat, toil and tears built our country that we may always be sympathetic to the plight of the common man. Grant us a sound mind to discern with the guidance of your spirit what is relevant and true using our God-given reason. Give us the diligence in finding our sources, the most exhaustive we can get for any given topic. Protect our sources from destruction and neglect and preserve our national memory. 
provide us with a critical mind in analyzing the sources we may arrive closest to the truth while recognizing that there can be as many perspectives as it can be. Teach us to be fair to each party while being faithful to the truth that is in our hearts. Remind us that history, aside from understanding and the complexity and diversity of the present, can also have the power to unite us and the power to make us proud of ourselves so we can build our own identity as a people. Demonstrate to us that our understanding of our own culture enriches our perspective of the past. Help us become a bridge of understanding between the academe and the people and make us learn the lessons of the past so we could create solutions to our present problems towards attaining a better future. Despite the gifts that you have given us, may we stay humble and see our work as a way of serving our students, our readers, our publics. Yet, may we see ourselves as bearers of true enlightenment and justice, not enablers of darkness and ignorance. May the way we tell the stories of our past be relevant to our people, that they may learn something from it. May we bring history closer to the people, all for your greater glory and for the nation that you have given us. Amen. Please be seated. To open up this inaugural session, may we call on Dr. Rene R. Escalante, Chairperson of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and concurrently the Executive Director of the National Quincentennial Committee. He is also the Chief Convener of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. To our esteemed guests, paper readers, and virtual participants, good afternoon to all of you. This international gathering is the biggest of its kind in the 88 years of existence of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. We have 100 speakers and around 39,000 registered webinar participants scattered in 13 sessions from this day, October 20 up to December 17, or a total of 100 hours. Not yet counting are the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands online viewers on YouTube, conference websites, and 100 Facebook pages. This is the ideal public history we were just dreaming before. Anyone can join in the comfort of their homes, anywhere in the world for free. The Philippine International Quincentennial Conference pushed through because of the support of the four biggest national professional historical societies. They are the Philippine National Historical Society, the Philippine Historical Association, Adhika ng Pilipinas, and the Philippine Academic Consortium of Latin American Studies. NHCP also got support from eight social sciences and history departments. This include the University of San Carlos, Ateneo de Manila University, University of the Philippines Diliman, University of the Philippines Baguio, University of the Philippines Los Baños, Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology, De La Salle University, and Father Saturnino Orios University. I would like also to acknowledge our colleagues in the government, like the National Quincentennial Committee, the Department of Foreign Affairs, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, National Museum of the Philippines, Department of Education, Office of Senator Juan Edgardo Angara, and Office of House Deputy Speaker Loren Legarda. This international gathering is inspired by the same academic event held in 2018 in Valladolid, Spain, in line with the 500th anniversary of the signing of the contract between Ferdinand Magellan and King Charles, which officially launched the Armada de Moluco, also known as the Magellan Elcano Expedition, 
the first to circumnavigate the world. We originally planned to have this at the Philippine International Convention Center, but COVID-19 pandemic jeopardized the plan and challenged us organizers to think of a better way in holding it virtually. More than just an event, the National Professional Historian, Historical Societies, Social Sciences and History Departments, and government agencies envisioned this international conference as a platform that will tell the Filipino people and the whole world that we have already history before the arrival of Magellan, contrary to what most of us were taught in the schools. Education Secretary Leonor Briones, in her virtual national message before millions of teachers and learners across the country on April 27, 2001, and she said, is it appropriate for us to use the colonial narrative that we are discovered? How many millions of learners at that time whose minds like mine were conditioned to this thinking? End of quote. The 2021 quincentennial commemorations in the Philippines, spearheaded by the Philippine government, has been painstakingly advocating for the Filipino viewpoint of Philippine history since 2018. We, in the National Quincentennial Committee, are at the forefront of combating misconceptions about our pre-colonial ancestors. We are exhausting all platforms to echo this advocacy which we have inherited from our predecessors as early as the time of Jose Rizal. The founders of the Philippine nation bequeathed us this document proclaiming Philippine independence on June 12, 1898, elevating the memory of Lapu-Lapu and the battle at Mactan against Magellan as a beacon of hope and freedom. That is why we are here in Kawit Cavite, the very site where Philippine independence was proclaimed to the world, to open the first session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. This theme, situating the Filipinos and the Philippines in 1521, is the collective statement of the major institutions of Philippine history in our country and of the Philippine government. This is indeed the right time to see ourselves in the vastness of pre-colonial history and bring to the present the values we shared with our distant ancestors, especially the heritage of victory and humanity. I enjoin each one of you to please share this conference to as many Filipinos as possible. Let us all learn together as a nation let not 2021 just pass an unordinary year. While we are combating our own battle in the present, let us not forget that in our very veins run the blood of the great heroes and illustrious men who showed the world how to value life and honor by defending our freedom and exhibiting compassion to whoever is in dire need. As the theme song of the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines, Bagani goes, Nakila ang lahi ko, bayaning Pilipino sa makabagong panahon. Thank you and let us all keep safe always. Thank you very much, Dr. Escalante. We shall now proceed with the remarks of the foreign ministers of the Republic of the Philippines, Portuguese Republic, and the Kingdom of Spain. First to deliver the remarks, we have the Honorable Chodoro Luxin Jr., the Foreign Affairs Secretary of the Republic of the Philippines. He will be followed by the Honorable Augusto Santos Silva, Foreign Minister of the Portuguese Republic, and the Honorable Jose Manuel Alvarez Bueno, Foreign Minister of the Kingdom of Spain.
This 2021, the Filipino people commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Battle of Mactan, where the Portuguese navigator of a Spanish expedition was killed. The occasion marks the Philippines' part in the first circumnavigation of the globe, while celebrating the fierce independence of our pre-colonial ancestors. Nation states were just then coming into being. Spain and Portugal had once been one. Spain was ruled by a German family when there was yet no Germany. The emperor was more Flemish in his affections and concerns than Spanish. Holding court in the Netherlands, his favorite, the Dutch rebel count, Egmont. The Spanish affection would be fulfilled by Philip, his son, who gave his name to our islands. Frustrated in his Flemish affections, the emperor resigned to live in a monastery. Father and son regarded the kingdom of heaven a worthier enterprise. By then, this empire of personal affections and hates and of religious rather than national beliefs was coming to an end. The scenes were godfather in modern dress with better grammar and diction. Our pre-colonial ancestors protected their distinctive island culture adjacent to the world's oldest, vastest, unified state then. Its technology, except in warfare, was the most advanced. Its writing, philosophy, and military strategy and organization was admired by Jesuits. Its bureaucracy, copied by Asian nation states, the first to appear in the world. Fearing nothing, our pre-colonial ancestors scattered themselves up and down an archipelago, itself starkly distinctive in its geographic isolation, and yet penetrable in feature like pieces of a scattered puzzle in the wide water of what we would call the West Philippine Sea. Geography is destiny. Destiny can make geography. From the nascent nationalism of those who waded out to meet him on their shores, Magellan met his end. As he fell, had he glimpsed the coming breakup of the universalist European world where he was born and raised by the same force that slew him so far from that place. That day marks the creation of Philippine identity as one country and of Filipinos as a distinct people, albeit part of the first empire on which the sun never set. In breadth and purpose, despite conflicting aims, it was the greatest empire in modern history. It achieved in redefining forever its subject peoples by imparting to them a Hispanic and Catholic identity, while allowing them to stay true to their original selves. They argued and fought each other in Spanish, Portuguese, and the native languages. It was the crucible of the mosaic of nations assembled today. These are historical facts, not nationalist fantasies. Today, we are inaugurating the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. In the next few weeks, over 100 scholars, diplomats, educators, and artists from around the world come together, perforce virtually, to explore how the Magellan Expedition, by its circumnavigation of the globe, shaped each of our respective national characters gave to each a shared yet distinctive identity to fight each for their own independence. Intertwining our history and destiny with those of Spain, Portugal, the South Pacific, Latin America, and the wider West that was coming into being to dominate the world for the next 500 years. That world is now being challenged to change, mindful of the once submerged now increasing more assertive diversity of its peoples or perish. The Department of Foreign Affairs is proud to serve as a convener of the inaugural sessions of this historic conference. We look forward to the panel discussions with Asian, European, and Latin American experts who will examine the lasting impacts of the circumnavigation on our international relationships, past and present, in trade, culture, policy, and geopolitics in an ever more tightly shared and common faith. 
There are things of mutual benefit we can learn from each other, such as the most likely configuration of our global future in the next 500 years by probing smarter the past we shared. I wish to congratulate and thank the conference's co-organizer, the National Quincentennial Committee chaired by Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea and the distinguished panel of speakers. As we Filipinos work towards the future, starting from the shared enterprise we inaugurate today, let us keep true to the legacy of our pre-colonial ancestors and embrace the reinvigorated Filipino nationalism that has defied time, that it may transcend it in a larger unity of wider purpose without losing itself. That is what we seek to define starting today. Next is a critically imperative climate conference. Let us step up, sure of ourselves and what we share, and go forward to the future of what all mankind needs to ensure on this one and only planet we all call home. Thank you. My dear friends, in such an important celebration as the 2021 Philippine International Quinta Centennial Conference, allow me first of all to thank Minister Theodora Loxin Jr. for inviting me to participate in the inaugural remarks. And I want to make some points. The first point, 2021 marks the 75th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between uh, our two nations, the Portuguese Republic and Republic of the Philippines. And this is really important. Our bilateral ties are centuries old and they are notable. They are notable not only by their longevity, but also by a shared diverse historical, cultural and religious heritage. This heritage connects us to this archipelago of Philippines composed of more than 7,000 islands. This year also marks the anniversary of the circumnavigation journey five centuries ago and the arrival of Fernão Magalhães in the Philippines, which makes it an especially symbolic year for Portugal and the Philippines. Portugal is carrying out a very comprehensive set of actions to commemorate the first circumnavigation journey. These actions take place in Portugal and abroad. The majority of the initiatives are organized by our temporary executive mission created to carry out the action program in close cooperation with the National Commission that promotes the involvement of the entire Portuguese society in these celebrations. And I mean the government, uh, municipalities, uh, regions, uh, universities, and so on. The circumnavigation journey greatly expanded the knowledge concerning navigation routes, geography, new nations. It was really an important stepping stone in the globalization of cultural and commercial exchanges. These interactions and the people-to-people -people connections continue today, creating opportunities for a deeper collaboration between institutions and governments, promoting mutual understanding and dialogue. Therefore, it is not surprising that cultural celebrations are usually at the forefront of these interactions. An important exhibition will take place in Lisbon between December 2021 and February 2022. In Portuguese, o menino Jesus de Cebu, um ícone da cultura e da história das Filipinas. Cebu Jesus, an icon of cultural and history of Philippines. This initiative and the ongoing collaboration between the Portuguese Diplomatic Archive and the Embassy of the Philippines in Lisbon will certainly allow to further the knowledge about our joint history. The Portuguese mission for the celebration of the voyage and the Philippines Embassy also had joint initiatives such as the issuance 
of special collection of stamps by CTT, our Portuguese company, and as well the organization of seminars, like the seminar from spices to startups. Unfortunately, uh, the pandemic has prevented uh, our SACS, the Portuguese Navy school ship, from finishing its circumnavigation travel and from stopping in Cebu on June 2020. As we know, the Philippines was strategically placed during the circumnavigation journey. But, and that is my second point, Philippines remains even more strategic today. The growing political and economic relevance of Southeast Asia is clear. And in this context, Portugal as a member state of the European Union has been always supporting the development of the relations between the European Union and ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. In fact, during the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union in the first semester of this year, 2021, we gave special focus to the development of the European Union's relations with the Indo-Pacific. And of course, this focus is in line with the elevation of the relationship between the European Union and ASEAN to a strategic level, a decision that we took last December 2020. The strategy of the European Union for cooperation with the Indo-Pacific was announced last September by the European Commission and the High Representative. This strategy confirms the importance of the relationship with the ASEAN and the geopolitical relevance of your region. The European Union is currently ASEAN's second trading partner. It is the first source of foreign direct investments in ASEAN member states. And it is one of the largest donors in helping you to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, the European Union has been supporting an inclusive dialogue with its Asian partners in tackling the pandemic and in promoting economic recovery. Portugal is very committed to this dialogue. Now, let me move to the third and final point. The ocean brought us together, Portugal and Philippines, many centuries ago, and I hope it will happen once again as the preparations for the European, for the United Nations Oceans Conference in Lisbon next year unfold. Portugal and the Philippines have much to share, and I am looking forward to the participation of the Philippines at this UN Ocean Conference and move forward together towards the sustainable use of the oceans, seas, and marine resources. A key, issue, a key issue for humanity in which Philippines and Portugal will certainly cooperate. See you in Lisbon uh, next year. Buenas tardes, Mabugay. Saludos desde España a nuestros queridos amigos filipinos. This year, 2021, is a very unique and symbolic year for our two countries, the Philippines and Spain. 200 years ago, Filipino and Spanish people met for the first time in Suluan and Homonghon. It was the first contact and was indeed a friendly and fruitful encounter, the beginning of a long-lasting friendship between our two people. But let me recall that very moment. Two years before, in 1519, the Magellan El Cano expedition left Spain towards the unknown in the search of a new route to the Spices Islands. After a very hazardous journey on March 16, 1521, the Spanish expedition arrived in Samar in very dire conditions, famished and thirsty without neither food nor water. However, native Filipinos offered them both, a sign of great magnanimity, generosity and humanity, which we acknowledge today. It was a journey, an expedition that changed the course of history forever as the world was circumnavigated for the first time in the history of mankind, a watershed that marked the beginning of a common destiny of our two people, Filipino and Spanish, and lasted for more than 300 years. 
an event that brought closer Asia, America, and Europe through the oceans, as well as through the West Hemisphere, as the Galleon route exemplified. Today, we commemorate together those events that changed the world forever. On this occasion, I want to thank Filipinos for all the commemorations that they are carrying out in remembrance of the first circumnavigation of the world by the unveiling of historical markers in the Philippines. Historical markers that recall us the route followed by the expedition through the Philippines. Today, 500 years later, our two countries witness the excellent shape of our bilateral relations, grounded on a long-lasting friendship. Spain and the Philippines will continue working together to preserve and enhance it in the next 500 years. We just heard the remarks of the foreign ministers of the Republic of the Philippines, Portuguese Republic, and the Kingdom of Spain for the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. To introduce now the Philippine President Rodrigo Roa Duterte, may we request Executive Secretary Salvador C. Medialdea, the Chairperson of the Philippine National Quincentennial Committee. On behalf of the National Quincentennial Committee, I welcome all of you to this international conference. With us today are distinguished historians scholars, scientists, artists, and lovers of history and culture. Also represented are four major national professional historical societies and the history departments of various higher education institutions of the Philippines, from the city of Baguio down to Iligan. With such an illustrious gathering of intellectuals, this conference, which will consist of 13 sessions beginning today, October 20, and concluding on December 17, 2021, can be called a historical event in its own right. Indeed, I am very much honored to be in your midst today. The conference's theme, situating the Filipino and the Philippines in 1521, perfectly encapsulates what we Filipinos want to contribute to history as an academic discipline, and that is the Filipino way of reading, analyzing, and understanding, and appreciating our past. As chairman of the National Quincentennial Committee, I champion with pride the Filipino viewpoint of our shared and inherited past. Let me illustrate briefly what this viewpoint means. In our history books, it is usually said that the Philippines was discovered by Ferdinand Magellan 500 years ago. I would admit, due to the education handed down to us, that even we Filipinos were prone to describing that event in the same way. But what I refer to as the Filipino way of reading history would put it quite differently. Since to discover simply means to be aware of something that was previously unknown, we would rather say that our ancestors discovered Magellan, his people, and his civilization, just as much as this Magellan discovered our islands, our ancestors, and our civilization. In truth, we discovered each other. If Filipinos will adopt this point of view, we will better appreciate our past. Contrary to how a number of history books and their visuals have depicted our ancestors, they were neither barbaric nor uncultured. We had, in fact, a thriving civilization even back then. We had laws and we traded with our neighbors. Promoting such a Filipino viewpoint does not diminish at all Magellan's contributions and legacy as an explorer. It is not our intention to take him away from this honored place in world history. But what it does is restore the dignity of the people that Magellan met when he landed in our shores. It opens our eyes to a better appreciation of the character of our people, the ancestors of the modern-day Filipinos, leading to a deeper understanding of who we are and where our country is at the present. 
as the National Quincentennial Committee has been emphasizing when we conduct their commemoration for the events that happened 500 years ago, it is not colonization that we are celebrating. Rather, we look back on how these events shape our life and fate as a people. We celebrate the magnanimity, compassion, and humanity of our ancestors in helping the impoverished crew of the expedition that traversed the Pacific Ocean. These are the same traits which allowed the first seeds of Christian faith to be sown in our land. And prior to that Islam, when that faith reached our islands several centuries earlier. We celebrate our ancestors' courage and bravery in Mactan, which later on inspired the founders of the Filipino nation to free our nation in 1898. Here at the very place where the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference is symbolically inaugurated, the Emilio Aguinaldo Shrine Kawit Kabite. As we look back, we also look forward, hoping to inculcate the values of the past in our present lives. By virtue of Proclamation Number 1128, President Rodrigo Roa Duterte declared 2021 as the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors. In the same spirit that led our president to issue this proclamation, we join the global commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the world. My sincerest gratitude and appreciation to the people and institutions behind the Philippine Quincentennial International Conference. Mabuhay kayong lahat. Greetings to the National Quincentennial Committee as you hold the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. I welcome this occasion as an opportunity to promote the glorious narrative of the Philippines over the past 500 years. May the scholarly meeting also contribute to our efforts to preserve and enrich a rich cultural heritage. I wish you a meaningful event. very much to President Rodrigo Roa Duterte, the President of the Philippines. To cut the opening program, may we give you Mr. Noel Rostata to sing his composition Bagani, the theme song of the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines and the 2021 Year of Filipino Pre-Colonial Ancestors. Pakisamat, bayarihan Subuk 
gentlemen, distinguished guests, this concludes the opening program of the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. Please stay tuned for the formal start of the session in a few moments. It will be moderated by the Department of Foreign Affairs. And we just witnessed the opening program of the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. It would be nice to see this event physically if not of the pandemic. As Ms. Catriona Gray said during the 2018 Miss Universe, we need to see the silver line in darkness. And that silver line is that we reach as many audiences across the country and around the world by converting the international conference online. 
Dr. René Escalante emphasized in his message that the historical commission has initially planned 13,000 participants or an average of 1,000 participants per session inside the Zoom webinar. But owing to the public demand, the historical commission increased its session to 3,000 Zoom participants, which means we are expecting 39,000 participants in the webinar during the entire duration of the PIQC. Partner, this is so far the biggest, the most attended, and the longest known history convention in Philippine history. Yes, partner, as Dr. Escalante said, not yet counted are the tens of thousands or even the hundreds of thousands online viewers on YouTube, conference website, and as I mentioned earlier, the more than 100 Facebook pages. He also remarked that this is the ideal public history we were just dreaming of before. Anyone can join in the comfort of their homes, anywhere in the world, anytime, for free. Yes, partner, the most important thing there is that this event is for free to everyone. We all love his statement, let us all learn together as a nation. He also acknowledged the institutions behind the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference, the four biggest national professional historical societies, and eight social sciences and history departments. And last but not the least partners, the National Quincentennial Committee, Department of Foreign Affairs, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the National Museum of the Philippines, the Department of Education, Office of Senator Juan Elgato Algara, and Office of House Deputy Speaker Lauren de Garda. NQC Chairperson Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea also underscored the Filipino way of reading, analyzing, understanding, and appreciating our own past. He also viewed the contact between our ancestors and Magellan 500 years ago as a mutual discovery, rather than the one-sided and Eurocentric discovery of the Philippines by Magellan. The Executive Secretary also addressed how a number of history books and their visuals have depicted our ancestors as either barbaric or uncultured. Our ancestors had, in fact, a thriving civilization even back then. We had laws and we traded with our neighbors. He also reminded us that by virtue of Proclamation Number 1128, the year 2021 is declared the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors. The National Commission for Culture and the Arts leads the said observance and is integral part of the Dayao 2021 National Indigenous Peoples Month this October. We also want to laud the participation of the foreign ministers of the Republic of the Philippines, Portuguese Republic, and Kingdom of Spain, and of course, President Rodrigo Nova Duterte, introduced by NQC Chairperson, Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea. This is just a start of the two-month-long gathering of historians, scholars, scientists, artists, and lovers of history and culture. We shall now proceed to the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference to be moderated by the Department of Foreign Affairs. Once again, this has been Ferdinand Isleta, Ali Luis, and Renena Peñas of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts from the Republic of the Philippines saying, maraming salamat po. Daghang salamat. Dios te admina and thank you and welcome to the Philippines International Quincentennial Conference. Mabuhay!
Uh, buenas tardes, boa tarde. And for our, especially for our panelists and others who may be watching from Spain and Portugal, uh, where it is 10 a.m. in Lisbon, 11 a.m. in Madrid. Um, and of course, to our panelists from Jakarta, it's 4 p.m. Uh, well, to those who um, uh, are experiencing the, be uh, the beginning of today, bom dia, buenos dias, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Um, welcome to the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. I have been uh, invited by the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, who is uh, moderating this inaugural session, um, uh, to moderate this particular panel. I'm Jeremy Barnes, the Director General of the National Museum of the Philippines, and it's a great honor uh, to be do uh, here with everyone this afternoon. Uh, I am your moderator for this first panel with the theme, Philippine Diplomatic Relations with Spain and Portugal in the Quincentennial. We are currently live on almost 100 Facebook pages, primarily uh, at the National Quincentennial Committee, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and other, other foreign service posts, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, among many others. We thank uh, also Radio Television Malacanang for streaming this inaugural session. Earlier, we witnessed the opening program of the inaugural session of the PIQC held at the Emilio Aguinaldo Shrine in Kawit, Cavite. To begin with, let me introduce the context of the PIQC inaugural session titled Viewing the Quincentennial. It is convened by the Department of Foreign Affairs with the National Historical Commission of the Philippines from today, October 20, until October 22. This inaugural session gathers the countries the Philippines is connected with in this quincentennial uh, celebration. Topics to be discussed are the current and future thrusts in maintaining international friendship. And through this international gathering, we position our country as a leader in the global commemoration. Alongside it, we proclaim to the world that we co-own here in the Philippines, the quincentennial with parody. Papers, messages, and statements from these sessions will form part of the proceedings of the PIQC so that many others who can't be with us today and future generations will be guided on how we in the Philippines and the world commemorated the milestones associated with the first circumnavigation of the earth. For this session, we are very fortunate to have been joined by four chiefs of diplomatic missions, whom I will introduce later, uh, as each is called upon to make their presentation. Before I start with that, may I encourage our Zoom attendees to use the chat or the Q&A function to send your questions. For our audience on Facebook, you may post your questions in the comments section and the technical team will collate and forward them to our speakers. Now, I hope our first uh, speaker is ready. He is our distinguished current Philippine ambassador to the Kingdom of Spain. He previously served as our ambassador to the Italian Republic from 1999 to 2010 with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of San Marino and the Republic of Albania. He was also our ambassador to the Portuguese Republic from 2012 to 2016. Born in 1945 to the late Henry Luillier and Angelita Escaño Jones, Ambassador uh, Luillier graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in management from De La Salle University, Manila, and received a diploma in gemology from the Gemology Institute of Antwerp in 1970 and the Gemology Institute of America in 1971. Prior to joining our foreign service, he served as chairman of the Philippines' largest chain of pawn shops, Cebuana Luillier. Ladies and gentlemen, 
It is my honor to introduce His Excellency, Philippe Jones Luillier, Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to Spain, with his topic for us today, the role of the first circumnavigation of the world in Philippine-Spanish relations. Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor, sir. Good afternoon, Paul Ambassador. Roa Duterte, Executive Secretary Salvador Vidaldia, Foreign Affairs Secretary Teodoro L. Loxin Jr., Ambassador Celia Ana Feria, Ambassador Jorge Morales, Deputy Head of Mission Manuel Bernardes Joaquim, Undersecretary Ernesto C. Abella, Mr. René R. Escalante, Executive Director of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Excellencies, Honored Guests, and Friends. Good morning. Buenos dias desde Madrid. Magandang hapon sa mga nanonood sa Pilipinas. Allow me to commend the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and the National Quincentennial Committee for the tireless effort in commemorating the 500th anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the world. Many important institutions in Spain and in the Philippines are also doing colossal contribution to commemorate this important milestone in our world's history. Back in 1542, the island of Leyte and Summer were named by Roy Lopez de Villalobos as Filipinas in honor of Philip, then Princess Astoria, who became Prince Philip II, King of Spain. Eventually, the name Las Islas Filipinas would be used to cover the whole archipelago. One can only speculate what the Philippine island could be called today. Had Spain not colonized us in the 15th century, the oldest universities, colleges, vocational schools, and the first public educational system in, in Asia were created during the Spanish colonial period through religious orders and Spanish missionaries. These institutions became Spain's vision to teach the Spanish language and culture and became a tool to evangelize Filipinos into the Christian faith. As an advantage to the Philippines, literacy improved among the Filipinos. Through the introduction of printing press by Father Diego de Nieva in 1593, our, lang our national language, and even by buying an ancient Philippine script were formally documented, allowing for the survival to the present times. This also led to the first publication in the Philippines, including prayer books and Doctrina Christiana, which were used for evangelization. In Southeast Asia, the Philippines and East Timor are the only countries that are predominantly Catholic, while majority of our neighbors practice Buddhism and Islam. Five centuries on, the Philippines still predominantly practices Catholicism. From this stems so much of our tangible and intangible tradition and cultural heritage. 
One of the more important priorities of the expedition of Magellan was to find species. While it turned out the Philippines did not have, the Philippines instead became a trading hub which allowed access to China's converted silt, which is a premium product in Europe and other goods. The Kalian trade, which used Manila as a port for Chinese products to enter the West, resulted in tremendous economic profit for Spain. With the end of the Gallian trade, Manila was forced to innovate and become an exporter of products such as sugar, abaca, and tobacco, with such other items as perfumes, Indian cotton, precious stones, and porcelain entering Manila as well. But goods were not the only exchanges taking place. It was ideas too, which served as an impetus for Filipinos to question the continued colonization of the Philippines. Barcelona and Madrid nurtured the great minds of the Philippines propaganda movement, our national hero. Jose Rizal's novel, No Le Metanger, was written during his stay in Madrid. After that followed Filipino writers who would write in Spanish, developing a body of Hispano Filipino literature. The Philippine Literary Award. Premio Zobel, which was founded in 1920, recognized excellence in Philippine writers who wrote in Spanish. It is only literary prize that promoted the Spanish language, which was the Philippines' only official language in three centuries. I am happy to inform you that the university, Universidad Rey Juan Carlos summer course this 2021 focus on Hispano-Filipino literature are made available to the public to the general support of Erasmus Plus and our collection to language continues Today, Spain encourages university students to take part in the Programa de Auxiliares de Conversación to be a language and culture assistance. And for this, I learned that other Filipino youths are in Spain under this program. As auxiliaries, they assist classes or small groups of students to develop the listening and conversational skill, as well as promote understand of one's own culture. The Philippine Embassy held a webinar with Professor Daisy Lopez, senior lecturer of the Spanish the Department of European Language of the University of the Philippines on the linguistic changes from Spanish to Filipino. It was involved in discussing discussion with people listening from different time zones and people chiming in in their native Cebuano, Iligaynon dialects, also have borrowed Spanish words. In late September, I was present with, with Filipinos 
and local cheerfully welcomed the opening of the first Jollibee store in Spain. They are on, there are still long lines during the weekend. As Filipinos from different parts of Spain trooped to Madrid to have a taste of home. This year, until mid-2022, multiple celebrations will take place in Spain to commemorate the 500th year of the anniversary of the circumnavigation of the world. From 29 October 2021 to 6 March 2022, the Reina Sofia venue at the Crystal Palace of Madrid's Retiro Park will be open to the public, greeting from a colossal exhibition made by Philippine national artists and noted filmmaker Kidlat Tahibik that explores the impact of colonialism of Philippine and indigenous culture. This arguable the first time for a living Filipino national artist to have an exhibition in the Crystal Palace since it was erected in 1887 on the occasion of the Philippine Exposition in 1887. Next year, we celebrate important milestone from with Spain, namely the 75th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations on the 20th anniversary of the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day, and to the, this end, the Philippine Embassy is networking with various agencies universities and institutions, both public and private, to further enhance people-to-people -people exchanges and to promote a true Philippine Studies program that reflects our shared history. 11,000 miles away, Asiona, one of the Spanish companies active in the Philippine government Build, build, build program is part of a consortium that is building the longest state bridge in the country, particularly in Cebu. The bridge is a critical component of the national infrastructure and will promote and further improve the life of our countrymen. Through all of these, one see the important link between the Philippines and Spain. The circumnavigation was one of the first steps in globalization, one of the first steps in making the world smaller, and the Philippines and Spain. The correction of an invisible threat that still connects both countries through the centuries. I think we have a connection issue with our embassy in Spain. May I get the guidance of the technical team if we'll be able to reconnect with Ambassador Luillier? Let's just give a moment. I'm sure they're attempting to uh, reestablish the connection. Well, as the ambassador was you know, sharing with us, you know, all kinds of activities uh, and initiatives and milestones will flow out of the Kincentennial. It's very exciting development, the exhibition of our national artists, uh, and especially our national artist for film, Kidlak Tahimik, in the Crystal Palace, or Palacio Cristal, in 
Retiro Park in Madrid, very important place uh, in Philippine and Spanish history. He was also speaking of uh, taking, you know, uh, important steps towards a commemoration of the 75th anniversary of our bilateral relations with, with Spain um, and the 20th Philippine-Spanish Friendship Day. So um, lots to look forward to, and I'm sure he might have shared uh, more uh, of what is uh, happening and what everyone can look forward to. Um, speaking of the circumnavigation, our ambassador in Madrid uh, was focusing on what that paved the way for uh, in terms of, of course, the galleon trade, the sharing of not only goods, but ideas, all kinds of influences in both directions uh, around the world. No? Um, when we speak of the galleon trade, we also speak of uh, Spanish America of those times, of what is today Mexico, many other countries uh, in that region. Um, so yes, uh, if he will not be able to rejoin right now. I suppose I'd better move on. Thank you, um, uh, Ambassador Luillier. Uh, and we will hopefully have you back uh, uh, during later in the panel. So moving on, I have the great delight to introduce not only a distinguished diplomat in the Philippine Foreign Service, but a good personal friend. Uh, she is the current ambassador of the Philippines to the Portuguese Republic. She is joining us live from Lisbon. Uh, a bit of background, she previously served as the Consul General and Deputy Chief of Mission of the Philippine Embassy in Madrid. Prior to this, served as Chief of Protocol under President Benigno Aquino III. Uh, as a Foreign Service Officer, she has served in France, Brazil, and Spain be before her present assignment in Portugal. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, my delight to introduce to you Her Excellency Celia Anaferia with her topic, the role of the first circumnavigation of the world in Philippine-Portuguese relations. Madam Ambassador, uh, please take the floor and good morning to you over there. Good morning from Lisbon. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, Ambassador Luguilier, Ambassador Moragas, Emmanuel. Good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon, Manila. So um, for the past four years, the Philippine Embassy in Lisbon has organized activities and events that highlight the unique narratives that connect the Philippines and Portugal. For the Philippine Embassy in Lisbon, 2021 is our reckoning year. 500 years after Fernando Magalhães, the Portuguese navigator who sailed for the Spanish crown, arrived and died in the islands we now call the Philippines. So there is no doubt that Hernando de Magalhães, a.k.a. Fernando de Magalhães, a.k.a. Ferdinand Magellan, sailed for the Spanish crown. It was the first of several other Spanish expeditions, which eventually led to the colonization of the Philippines by Spain. But I'm getting ahead of my story here. So we have a Portuguese navigator whose idea of sailing west to get to the east with the aim of reaching the coveted Spice Islands in the Moluccas, which now form part of Indonesia, was totally rejected by the Portuguese king, Manuel I. So feeling hurt, but more convinced than ever that his theory was right, he sold his, neck, his idea next door to the Spanish king, Charles I of Spain. So in today's business terms, we can perhaps consider Magellan's move akin to uh, move to Spain, akin to a uh, startup. He, he pitched his ideas to two big venture capitalists, got rejected by one, but was bought up by the other. So since my arrival in Portugal in 2017, I have had the opportunity to learn more about our shared cultural and historical narratives with Portugal through the various activities of the fifth centennial commemorations of the victory of Mactan and the Magellan Elcano circumnavigation expedition. Um, these commemorative milestones have provided the Philippine Embassy in Lisbon an avenue to reinforce the progression of our bilateral relationship with Portugal by learning each other's past 
by revisiting Magellan's voyage to the islands, we now call the Philippines, and his interaction with the peoples of those islands. In, in looking at the Magellan narrative in the context of Philippine-Portugal relations, it has undoubtedly raised the level of awareness as well as the appreciation of the Philippines' national, historical, cultural, and religious identities in Portugal, and it has definitely highlighted our common legacies. So promoting our culture and heritage in Portugal during the centennial commemoration, well, it's indeed a once in a lifetime milestone event. It is for this reason that the Philippine Embassy in Lisbon, Lisbon took the opportunity to make the most out of these celebrations by, by developing an inclusive cultural diplomacy program that would focus on our common narratives with the primary objective to further strengthen the framework of Philippine-Portugal relations. We were able to achieve this and we continue to do so by utilizing an array of cultural diplomacy tools that reach out to all sectors of Portuguese society, including the Filipino community in Portugal, who we consider our, as our partners in promoting Philippine cultural heritage and values in this country. So in 2017, the Philippine Embassy began its first activity, which was aimed to rediscover our cultural and historical links with Portugal. This activity became known as the Magellan Lecture Series. And the concept of this lecture series involved Philippine historians who provided their unique historical viewpoints about anything about the Philippines. So that first year, our first lecturer was Dr. Stephanie Ku, assistant professor of, uh, of the Ateneo de Manila University and currently a postdoctoral Marie Curie fellow at the Nova School of Law in Lisbon. So um, Stephanie's presentation was entitled Philippine Women's Clothing, uh, problematizing class appearances and colonialism, and talked about the evolution of 19th century Philippines, of clothing and evolution of clothing in 19th century Philippines. And her research actually led to the publication of her award-winning book, Clothing the Colony. Then the next year, we were lucky to have Dr. Danilo Madrid Herona. Um, he is the author of the book Ferdinand Magellan the Armada de Maluco, and the European discovery of the Philippines, a book which was actually 10 years in the making and based on primary sources found in Spanish and Portuguese archives, among others. His book has actually become the embassy's reference book on our Philippine narratives within the context of the first circumnavigation of the world by the Magellan Elcano expedition. So Dr. Herona uh, gave us an enlightening discussion on Philippine history in the 16th century. He presented various revelations and theories that challenged the various historical viewpoints, not, not only about Magellan and the circumstances surrounding his journey to the Philippine Islands, but he also gave us a better understanding of the nature and character of Lapu-Lapu, of course, the chieftain of Mactan Island, and, and the inhabitants of the islands during that period. And I believe Dr. Herona is the only Filipino author that has written extensively about Ferdinand Magellan. Then the next year, we were lucky, um, 2019, we had Dr. Ambeto Campo of Ateneo de Manila, who gave uh, a presentation called Mapping the Philippines Before Ways in Google Earth. So in this presentation, Ambet showed the you know, visual presentations of a series of ancient maps of the Philippines. And he explained that you know, cartography is actually a visual language wherein we can, it can be used to communicate information and also to help provide data and insights on how the Philippine islands were viewed by foreign cartographers. But the highlight so far of the Magellan Lecture Series was a conference organized by the embassy also in December 2019, which was entitled Magalhães, Magallanes, Magellan, Magellan in Philippine History Through Philippine Historians. And this was held at the prestigious um, Sociedad de Geografia de Lisboa or the Lisbon Geography Society. It's an institution created in 1875. Now, I decided on this title because I felt it aptly summarizes Magellan's narrative in our, in our history. Um, he was Portuguese, therefore Magalhães. He sailed for Spain and therefore Magallanes. And we know him in our hearts and minds by the anglicized name Magellan. Now, the conference was participated by five renowned Philippine historians, and namely, we had Dr. Danilo Herona, Ambeto Campo, then we um, had Dr. Feliz Noel Rodriguez, Dr. Chas Navarro, and our very own Dr. René Escalante, Chairman of the National Historical Commission. So it was the first time in Portugal that Philippine historians were able to present their views 
from a Philippine perspective about one of Portugal's most famous navigators. Now, the aim of the conference was not in any way to rewrite Philippine history, but rather, like um, I said then, deconstructed food. Our aim was to take apart and study elements of our history. We shared our stories from a precise period in our history. One were magnanimity and humanity were central themes around Magellan's participation in our history. Now, another important endeavor of the Philippine Embassy in Lisbon was to develop historical research projects in the context of, uh, of a Portuguese perspective about Philippine history in the 16th to 18th centuries that could systematically recapture the complex nuances, the people, the meanings and events, and even ideas of that time period that have influenced and shaped the present. So we were lucky because with the help of uh, our friends, distinguished academic researchers from the Centro de Humanidades or CHAM of the Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, the embassy is proud to say that we have what we call our three legacy projects. So the first one is a research on the Philippines in Portuguese history and historiography, which is a research publication aimed at identifying which Portuguese archives incorporated the highest number of documents pertaining to the Philippine islands and to provide an outline of that nature. The project was an effort at systematizing Portuguese historiography on the Philippines. Then the second project, it's a book entitled The Islands Beyond the Empire, a collection of essays on the history of um, Portuguese relations with the Philippines, again in the 16th and 18th century. Now, this book is a compilation of the most relevant essays written by contemporary Portuguese historians and academics regarding the early modern history and culture of the Philippine archipelago. Now, these are essays that have been published in proceedings and in seminars and conferences as well as in academic journals and publications throughout the last decade, but have never been before gathered in pre and presented in a single volume. And the, 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 the other, and what we, we consider our holy grail, it's called the Documenta Filipina, which is uh, the Philippines and Portuguese archives and library. It is a bibliography aimed at locating and identifying historical materials relevant to the history of the Philippines in Portuguese archives and libraries. Now, we in, intend to generate an extended and manageable list of information. The project focused on the archives considered most relevant and important to the Philippines, which are located in Lisbon. And the final result is a comprehensive research guide on the subject, including references and basic information on each document, which uh, ideas it to be used as a working tool for Filipino scholars and academics. The materials and documentations of this three, what we like to call legacy projects of the embassies, are our narratives, which are being brought out for the first time to benefit the Filipino and, and, and other end users. Of course, to accomplish this worthwhile projects, we required a budget. And we at the Philippine Embassy are very grateful to former Senator and now Deputy Speaker Lauren de Garda, to Senator Franklin Dillon, and of course, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Teodoro L. Oxine Jr., for giving us the financial means to promote these narratives. But our project with CHAM does not end there. In fact, due to our continued engagements with both Filipino and Portuguese historians and the academe in promoting our shared narratives, it has resulted in even more discoveries about the Philippines, I mean, pre and post 1521, in the vast and untapped Portuguese archives and libraries. So we are currently working with CHAM on additional projects such as the Philippines in Portuguese cartography, again, 16th and 18th century. Then there is early news about the Philippines in 16th century Europe. And to promote another of our narratives here, soon a Portuguese edition of Jose Rizal's Noli Metangere. Now, back to our activities in the embassy. In November 2019, we also used film to tell our narratives here in Portugal. A week before our Magellan Conference at the Sociedade de Geografia, we commemorated the 100 years of Philippine cinema with a Filipino film retrospective at the Cinemateca Portuguesa, which is just right behind me. 
the MC. Um, it was entitled, so you can see, Cine, Cinema das Filipinas, Nos Cien Anos do Cinema Filipino. So we presented the evolution of Philippine cinema through 15 well-curated Filipino films representing the three golden ages of Philippine cinema, including the emergence of Philipp if independent films. Now, this um, film retrospective gave the Portuguese audience a preview on the technical and artistic sophistication of the Philippine film industry during the past 100 years. And of course, it showed the excellence of the Filipino as an artist. We had a film called Balikbaya Number no. 1, Memories of Overdevelopment Redux 6 by Philippine National Artist for Film, Kidlat Tahimik, who also graced the opening of that film festival. Now, the movie is premised on another character in the story of Magellan, um, Enrique de Malaca, being Filipino and therefore the first OFW. And as Kidlat says, he was the first person to circumnavigate the world. Um, another um, of our activities, and in keeping with the Quincentennial celebrations, we also had an exhibition of banigs or esteiras, as they are known in Portugal. And the exhibit was held at the Fundação Ricardo do Espírito Santo in the iconic Alfama district of Lisbon in, from November, to, uh, November 2019 to January the next year. So we invited historian and banig expert Elmer Nocheseda, who traced the historical accounts of the Italian Antonio Pigafetta, who was Magellan's chronicler. And in his 1525 manuscript, Primo Viaggio in Torno al Mondo, where um, it was concluded that the Panig, or the Philippine map, um, the Shtera, played an important role when Magellan was cordially received by local chieftains in the island of Cebu 500 years ago. So according to the chronicles, we can conclude that on several occasions, Magellan ate, slept, and was warmly received on, on, on the Banig. Um, actually, these Banigs were made in Basse in Samar, which uh, is 150 kilometers from the first uh, from Giwan, the first island that uh, Magellan landed when he reached the islands we now call the Philippines. Now, then there is this existing city, sister city relationship between Cebu and Sabrosa, the known birthplace of Magellan. So to give body and substance to the cooperation, we have continued to engage both um, the local governments in Cebu and Sabrosa. A visit by the Cebu city officials to Sabrosa was unfortunately canceled because of the pandemic, but nonetheless, the community lines between both executives continue to remain open, and there's a possible visit by Cebu officials in the coming months. Now, an offshoot of this activity did, however, take place under the Embassy's Cultural Diplomacy Initiative, and this was an exchange of art activity between the children of the Cebu Normal University and the Escola Básica Fernando de Magalhães, in Sabrosa, were in children between the ages of five and nine through their depictions of Magellan and the Philippines. And, and our aim here was to promote intercultural awareness with the young ones. Now, as we all know, 2020 was a challenging time for all of us as the global pandemic uh, brought in many uncertainties. But like everyone on the planet, we reconfigured our activities, activities shifting most to the digital platforms. So to highlight the end of the Philippine part and the first circumnavigation of the world, I wrote an article which was published in print as well as uh, an, on an online format um, by the Diario de Noticias, Portuguese's oldest, Portugal's oldest newspaper. And this was published on 30 April 2021. I titled it again, Magalhães, Magalhães, Magellan. So my article centered on the main message of the Philippine narratives during the Philippine centennial celebrations and the narrative of Magellan's journey to what is now the Philippine Islands and how the Santo Nino, which he presented as a gift, became a legacy of that expedition and where it continues to have longstanding spiritual and religious influence on Filipino society today. So I also touched on the untimely death in Mactan of Magellan and how perhaps, if I dare say, his hubris and lack of understanding of the local political and social dynamics in the islands of Cebu and Mactan, which was ruled by independent chieftains or rajas, led him to making the wrong strategic and tactical decisions 
when dealing with Raja Lapu-Lapu. So it makes one think, and while writing the article, I thought, what if he had landed in Mactan before Cebu? Could he and Lapu-Lapu instead have been allies? Would we be celebrating 500 years of circumnavigation? Or would Magellan, after finding the Moluccas, returned by the Pacific Ocean? I mean, these are just things to ponder about. Now, as mentioned earlier by Minister Augusto Santos Silva, in July this year, an online webinar entitled From Spices to Startups was co-organized by CHAM, Ateneo de Manila, and the Philippine Embassy. And, and, and this, this, this online webinar was actually a special panel, which is part of a bigger conference organized by CHAM and the Ateneo. The idea for this special panel came from our dear friend, Professor Paulo Pinto, and it was aimed to draw attention to the long-standing friendship between the Philippines and Portugal by revisiting historical economic connections and linkages as a way to stimulate emerging trade and investment potentials between the Philippines and Portugal. Now, through this special panel, we were able to provide the audience with a glimpse of the viewpoints and experiences of our various panelists on how Philippines and Portugal economic relations have evolved, developed over the years, and presently continue to pro progress in so far as trade, infrastructure, technology, and business in general is concerned. We, you know, we brought up stories of how Portugal exported that famous Mabuti sardines, and this story dates me. Um, and, um, and, and of course, our Filipino investments in Portugal through NST Apparel's president, Lawrence de los Santos, who spoke um, during that panel, and the Philippines' participation in the Web Summit, which is the largest tech conference held in Europe and is hosted by, by this one every year. Also, as mentioned by Minister Augusto Santos Silva, with the support of the Estructura de Misao para as Comemorações do Quinto Centenario, the Primeira Circumnavigação do Mundo pela Expedição Magalhães Elcano, and I'm just impressing you here with my Portuguese, the Correios de Portugal, or the post office, issued three special edition stamps featuring images that link the historical narrative of Ferdinand Magellan with the Philippines. Now, these stamps feature the art, the winning artwork of Mr. Bernardo Maak entitled Presentation of the Icon. And it's 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 now in the two euro fifty stamp. And then we have the image of the Santo Niño de Cebu in the one euro stamp and the iconic image of Magellan's Cross in Cebu City on the 54 cent stamp, which and these stamps were officially launched to the public in July um, this year. Now, with the same support, and this is very interesting, the embassy also partnered with the Adega de Sabrosa, a winery in the town of Sabrosa, in launching the Santo Nino White Port wine. Um, in doing this, the Adega de Sabrosa not only pays tribute to the courage, determination, tenacity, and vision of its, the town's most renowned citizen, Fernando Magalhães, but it also to the most, but also gave honor to the most revered religious image whose introduction to the Philippines is actually linked to Fernando Magalhães. And, um, and finally, as, um, as the embassy's closing event in Portugal for the commemoration of the Philippine part in this first circumnavigation of the world, together with the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, the Museo de Sao Roque in Lisbon, and the Basilica Minore del Santo Nino in Cebu, we are launching an exhibition entitled Santo Nino de Cebu, an icon of Philippine culture and history. And this will take place from 9 December this year until February 6 next year. Um, this will be at the temporary exhibition space behind the altar of the iconic Igreja de Sao Roque in Lisbon. I mean, if anybody who's been here to Lisbon, it's a beautiful church right in the heart of Seattle. This, is, this, this exhibit is based on the Santo Nino exhibition of the NHCP, which was launched in April this year in Cebu. Um, and through this exhibit, we aim to highlight the historical narratives of how the devotion to the Santo Nino is deeply rooted in Philippine culture, as well as how the Santo Nino's modern depiction is a reflection of uh, Filipino piety. And as mentioned above, how this most revered religious image 
is eternally linked to Fernal de Magalhães. Um, for the first time, we will have two 19th century original regalias of the Santo Nino. Um, it will leave the Basilica de Cebu and will be brought to Lisbon and displayed to the public here for the first time. Through this, these and other artifacts on exhibit, we intend to impart a profound impression on the Portuguese audience of the historical narrative and significance of the Santo Nino in the lives of the Filipino. Now, the story of the Santo Nino is not complete without the celebration of the Sinulog. So we thank the city government of Cebu and the Sinulog Foundation in Cebu also for supporting the embassy and the Filipino community in Portugal in celebrating in January next year, January 16th, a Sinulog mass, which um, is an integral part of the Santo Nino exhibit in Lisbon. So together with the Philippine chaplains in Lisbon, we hope to again have the Cardinal of Lisbon join us for another celebration of the Holy Mass in honor of the Santo Nino de Cebu. So in closing, finally, um, 2021 has really been a special landmark year for Philippine-Portugal relations. So first, the 75 years of diplomatic relations when the Portuguese Republic sent the then governor of Macau, Gabriel Mauricio Teixeira, as its representative to the inauguration of the Republic of the Philippines on 4 July, 1946. And of course, this year, both Philippines and Portugal commemorate the 500 years of the Magellan Elcano expedition with our own respective narratives. So these are important commemorative milestones which have greatly contributed in raising the level of awareness of the Philippines and Portugal through our shared narratives. Now, after 500 years, our narratives continue to cross the oceans. We look forward to creating and embracing new narratives in our bilateral relations with Portugal. We are working to achieve more dynamic bilateral engagements in new fields, and we'll continue to engage each other in various multilateral fora where both Portugal and the Philippines have common interests and priorities. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy, I end my presentation. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador. Um, muito obrigado. Uh, your knowledge, your fluency in Portuguese is truly, stu truly stunning, ma'am. Um, and it's a delight to listen to your very, very substantive presentation. Wow, so, 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 so many things uh, are happening there. Um, uh you know from our embassy in lisbon and throughout portugal i will come back to you madam ambassador for you gave me a lot of things that uh, a moderator should seize on not to facilitate a lively discussion uh, among the panelists um well uh on that note um thank you again and it is now my pleasure to move on from our philippine ambassadors in spain and Portugal to their counterparts here with jurisdiction over the Philippines. And uh, now we I, I have the pleasure of calling upon the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of Portugal in Indonesia with concurrent jurisdiction over the Philippines. So a huge jurisdiction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, Emmanuel Bernardes Joaquim, uh, with his topic, the role of the first circumnavigation of the world in Portuguese Philippine relations. So, obviously, from the point of view of Portugal, uh, Senor Bernardes Joaquim, please, uh, please take the floor. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Director General Barnes. Uh, good morning to Ambassador Celia Feria in Lisbon, to the Ambassador of the Philippines in Madrid. Good afternoon to the Ambassador of Spain in Manila. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, uh, wherever you're, you're watching us. This is indeed a true circumnavigation, an online circumnavigation now. It's much faster to do it. We don't no longer take years. Uh, indeed, it's a huge jurisdiction, and uh, it's uh, maybe an, an even more huge task to speak after Ambassador Feria, because indeed, uh, I guess she already covered everything that I could possibly say. 
But let's say if uh, I have one or two words left, and for sure, uh, not only did she cover it, she did it much better than I could possibly do. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, this is indeed a year in which we have a lot to commemorate, as uh, you've already heard from our minister and the Ambassador Peria. Uh, it is uh, the year in which we commemorate the 500 years of the Philippine part in the cir circumnavigation. And it was no small part, as I'm going to show uh, afterwards. Uh, in which we celebrate or commemorate the 500 years of the death of Ferdinand Magellan on April 27th and the victory in the Battle of Mactan. But it is also, from the point of view of uh, the Portuguese-Philippine bilateral relations, the year in which we commemorate the 75 years of our diplomatic relations. Uh, later on, as you will see, I uh, uh, somehow place all these events in one big process that is still going on and that uh, we hope will go on for, for much longer uh, uh, and how um, the one and other events uh, are somehow connected. But first, let me go to uh, our program of commemorations until now, so far. It would have started last year in the Philippines, in our case, uh, with uh, the passage of our training ship, Sagres, uh, a ship that takes the name from uh, the Sagres School, the school from which uh, uh, our navigations in the 15th and 16th centuries departed. Uh, uh, it would have passed by Cebu by mid-June, but unfortunately it was one of the collateral damages of uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, the ship was exactly passing by South Africa and we had to turn back. Um, it is really a pity that we couldn't celebrate all together in Cebu. We had an all, a whole program prepared. Uh, our then ambassador would uh, uh, be together with uh, um, the local community, uh, including the, the, the Portuguese residents in the Philippines, but unfortunately it couldn't happen. Uh, but this year on April 27th, there were quite a few uh, events, both in the Philippines and in Portugal regarding the commemorations of the death of Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, indeed, a Portuguese serving the Spanish crown, but uh, that is uh, still uh, admired throughout the world and known uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, uh, a Portuguese coming from a very small place, uh, as is Sabrosa, uh, and uh, uh, who um, indeed offered us the world map as we see it today. Uh, the man who concluded the process of the first globalization. Um, I, I don't like to call it discovery because indeed I see discovery as a also a process. Uh, but even uh, uh, but it, it, it's true that um, uh, uh, it concluded the the age of discoveries, which I see as a process that is not one-sided, but that is mutual mutual discovery. It's true that back then it was the Europeans who came all the way here, but they were being as much discovered as they were discovered. Um, but going back to the Philippine part of uh, the process that was the circumnavigation of the world, even though now Victoria uh, uh, only concluded itself the circumnavigation trip once it got back to crossing uh, San Lucas de Barrameda, the truth is that it was by arriving in the Philippines after having crossed the biggest ocean in the world for the first time that those men somehow uh, uh, concluded a circumnavigation trip for humanity. Because indeed, uh, by reaching the Philippines, uh, we were back into a region that was already known to the Europeans. Uh, we uh, were back in contact with uh, uh, um, cultures uh, with whom uh, or with which we had already had contact in the past. For instance, there is a, a, a reference in, in uh, Stefan Zweig's biography of Magellan that refers to that. So in the court of uh, um, the king of Cebu, uh, Magellan and uh, uh, his um, fellow navigators found, for instance, uh, traders, uh, more uh, traders uh, uh, to, uh, to, to whom they were so used quite near the, the Iberian Peninsula and in other parts of Southeast Asia. But the circumnavigation trip itself is also a part of not only a process, but quite a few processes. There's all, there's all the great historical events uh, um, 
they, they end up being part of a web, a complex web of different processes. One of course, is, uh, as I said, is the process of what we call the age of discoveries and the first process of globalization. Uh, of course, that is a process that is based also in the, uh, I don't think it's only called the age of discoveries because or uh, for the discovery of new lands and uh, discovery of what for us were new peoples, but also because uh, uh, it was based on a, uh, a period of innovation in technique and in technology of navigation. And so basically the techniques, the new techniques and the new technology of navigation centered in the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal and Spain uh, uh, were also part of the discoveries of the 15th and the 16th century. Um, and they uh, enabled us to start a process that uh, uh, we uh, uh, continue to date, which is a process of mutual discovery. Uh, in the case of Portugal, uh, it, it had somehow started even a little before the, the circumnavigation trip. There were uh, some exchanges from uh, expeditions coming from uh, uh, the Portuguese headquarters in Malacca going to the Moluccas in Indonesia, uh, particularly in the south of the Philippines and Mindanao. But indeed, uh, 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 officially or in a more concrete way, they happened in the circumnavigation trip in which we were not as a nation, but with Portuguese nationals. Um, later on, uh, uh, we kept those contacts uh, uh, through uh, lots of Portuguese traders and uh, missionaries. So there was both a trade, an economic, and a religious component uh, that uh, was a little more intense during the period of dynastic union, but that went on throughout the centuries. Uh, and another uh, uh, interesting relation that is, uh, um, uh, or, an, or another relation that is interesting to, to look at is the relation between, for instance, Manila and Macau. Uh, um, both of them uh, commercial trade outposts and, and that exchanged mutual influence uh, uh, besides trade, of course, uh, like for instance, the Portuguese brought uh, uh, the Portuguese and the, the Chinese who were based in Macau uh, uh, brought among other products, the porcelain to, to Manila. And there was mutual influence in the architecture of uh, uh, both cities. Uh, and so uh, uh, even though there was not a, a, a concrete national uh, um, projection, there were nationals from, uh, or uh, the, uh, individuals from both peoples uh, um, uh, producing those exchanges. But another uh, important point of this process of mutual discoveries, of course, and that's how I connect to the other thing that we're commemorating this year, uh, the moment in which two nations established diplomatic relations. Uh, the period is another period of globalization. Uh, it's probably what could be considered the second globalization of the world, the globalization of the international system, when the nation state becomes global uh, and uh, uh, the whole world uh, is filled with nation states. And indeed, uh, uh, that is a new phase that, uh, that, that starts also a new phase of uh, uh, that process of mutual discovery. Because from now on, we're no longer talking about mutual discovery just among two people uh, and perhaps even some uh, uh, in, in a, uh, well, in a, a more dissimilar, uh, uh, from a more dissimilar point of view. Uh, but now we are talking about mutual discovery from two actors that are equivalent, that are equals, and that are partners. Um, from there, of course, we go to uh, the present day. And now we're not even long, no, uh, any longer talking just about the mutual discovery uh, or a mutual discovery centered on, on nation states, even though, as we can see, governments, uh, namely through their embassies, uh, uh, can still play a very important role uh, in that process. But now we have a lot of new actors involved. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the civil society, the academy, uh, mere individuals deciding to travel on tourism, uh, uh, and they're all part of that process. 
Um, it has uh, another similar thing to uh, what was on the base of the first Egypt discovers, which is also innovation and technological development, which is right now very dynamic in both the Philippines and Portugal. And it is, uh, even though it must be uh, supported uh, by, by, by governments, it, it is indeed a, a very much a, a, the result of entrepreneurs on both sides. Um, uh, and uh, uh, um, academic institutions also play a very important role in that dynamic. Um, in, in the case of Portugal, uh, I'm always glad to see the increasing interests of Filipino students in coming to Portugal through uh, student uh, exchange programs like Erasmus Mundus. And that uh, those are indeed programs that we should promote more and more, and maybe even uh, 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 more particular programs. But also uh, cooperation between the, the academy in both countries. And one example was uh, that event that took place between June and July this year, the Context and Continuity this Conference, in which I had uh, the pleasure and the honor to participate, being invited by the Embassy of the Philippines in Lisbon but also all the work, the research work uh, that is being done behind. Uh, uh, of course, here it was already uh, um, stressed, but uh, uh, I will do it again, mostly between the Ateneo de Manila and the Universidad Nova de Lisboa. Also, as I said, and we hope that we can go back to that as soon as possible, uh, tourism. Uh, there are many reasons for, for there to be mutual interest and curiosity from Filipinos and Portuguese in each other's countries. Uh, one of them, of course, are uh, shared culture and religion, but also, uh, and even more, what's different, because we're talking about a discovery process, as I said. Uh, what's more interesting here is to see how our common things uh, uh, are seen in, in the different countries and also what's, what's there that is different. And that's so interesting. But when it comes to tourism, uh, um, it's also uh, not only uh, a, an element of that discovery process, but it's also an area, a sector in which we work together. And I am glad uh, to, to say that this year we had the first meeting of uh, a, a recently created working group on tourism between Portugal and uh, the Philippines, uh, um, an area in which uh, indeed we uh, wish to uh, invest more and more and in which we can see uh, results, uh, further results very soon. Uh, and of course, it is about cultural exchange. And uh, uh, once again, a very good example of that is the exhibition that the Embassy of the Philippines and Lisbon is also organizing, and which I hope to visit in person soon, uh, in the Igreja de São Roque, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, but, but also uh, 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 all the programs that are promoted by, by both embassies and the more general programs in which we're inserted. In, in our case, for instance, the, the, the European uh, wide programs in, in the Philippines, such as the, the European Cinema Festival and other programs. Um, indeed, we have a lot to commemorate. And to me, uh, for me, commemorate uh, is not merely reliving the past. The memory is uh, in, in itself a living uh, um, uh, body uh, uh, that changes through that process of discovery to which I've been referring to. Uh, and uh, we live it differently depending on the part of that process in which we are. Uh, but mostly, uh, we also change our memory depending on the way we look into the future. So for me, commemorating is not only looking into the past, it's uh, a way of projecting ourselves into the future with concepts that are familiar, but, have, but that have changed through time. Um, and uh, it is with that concept in mind that uh, uh, I will say that I myself will be gladly and uh, very happily continuing commemorating uh, all this uh, um, uh, historical marks uh, uh, in our relations, the circumnavigation trip, the 75 uh, years of diplomatic relations, uh, and more than commemorating, I will be celebrating it. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, sir. Uh, that was uh, the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Portuguese Embassy in Indonesia with concurrent jurisdiction over the Philippines, Senor Manuel uh, Bernardes Joaquim. Very, very informative uh, presentation, sir. Thank you for sharing so, so many insights with us. Um, as a museum director uh, who has been around the the Southeast Asian region quite a lot. I always like to highlight the importance of what I see in Macau, uh, the Portuguese Chinese heritage vis-a-vis -vis the Spanish Filipino heritage of Manila and the history when these two cities, Manila, Macau, um, were, were really the, the gateways you know, of the Iberian Peninsula in Asia. I think there's a lot more that can be explored and appreciated between um, Macau and us, and even beyond Macau to, uh, you know, Malacca and Goa, you know, in Portuguese history. Um, just, you know, to, to, uh, just to digress, you know, even something like our research here in the National Museum on uh, one of the icons of Philippine culture, the use of capiz shell windows. Our research traces it to pos a possible origin in Macau developed uh, uh, by Chinese uh, builders. You know? um, and also, it's quite well known that the use of shell windows is uh, historically common in Goa. You know? So as we look for origins and connections, um, you know, uh, more engagement with uh, Portuguese cultural heritage in Asia and especially also, of course, in Portugal itself, um, I think is very worthwhile. Uh, I say that after listening to both Ambassador Feria and Senor Bernardes Joaquim, um, and uh, gives, uh, gives people like me and probably many of our audience today uh, lots of food for thought. And I especially like the emphasis on tourism uh, because um, after everything that Ambassador Feria said, I am also keen to visit this exhibit in Lisbon in person and, and, to, uh, uh, and to explore everything uh, in Portugal that um, our ambassador there has, uh, has you know, highlighted our connections with. Fantastic. Um, for our final uh, speaker of this panel, we now move to a very distinguished uh, man, uh, we're the ambassador of the Kingdom of Spain to the Philippines, also a, um, a person who has uh, become a friend. Uh, it's my honor to introduce him to this uh, uh, audience today. Um, he joined the Spanish Diplomatic Corps in 1995. He has represented Barcelona as a you know, as uh, in the Parliament of Spain, uh, in the Congress of Deputies, as a member of the People's Party since 2004. During his legislative career, he uh, was a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, the Joint Commission for the European Union, and the Committee on International Cooperation and Development. Uh, he has, during his career, he made more than 20 interventions. I suppose that's like um, a privileged speech no? in our context. Um, uh, defending the principles of and values of democracy, freedom, and human rights in areas of the world where they are threatened. He has al also promoted many initiatives to do with Cuba and Venezuela in the European Parliament. Prior to his posting here in Manila, he served as Spain's, uh, as the permanent representative of Spain to the United Nations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome um, His Excellency Jorge Moragas Sanchez, ambassador of the Kingdom of Spain to the Philippines with his topic, the role of the first circ circumnavigation of the world in Spanish-Philippine relations. Uh, Senor Embajador, bienvenidos, please take the floor. Maringanda Japón, or Gabi, señor Lahat. Muy buenas tardes, buenas noches. Um, thank you, uh, my friend Jeremy Barnes, uh, acting today as a moderator of this uh, great panel. And I just want to, to say hello um, and to greet, of course, Ambassador Kuki Feria in Lisbon, 
and Philippe Lullier in Madrid, and uh, Deputy here, Head of Mission Emmanuel Bernardes from Jakarta. And all of the viewers and followers of this uh, panel organized uh, together by the DFA and the um, Philippine International Cincentennial Commission. Uh, um, so very happy to, to share uh, my opinions regarding the issue that you mentioned with all of you. Let me fix my uh, narrative, if I can say that, uh, in, in some facts that we know uh, for sure that happened. And uh, I think it's important to remember that. And, uh, and we know that happened because uh, we got them, we understood them through the primary sources, especially the Pigafetta Chronicle. As you know, Pigafetta was this Italian uh, kind of journalist of the, of the 15th, uh, 16th century that was working with him. Um, Magellan, who uh, wrote down all the the trip of the journey, and he was one of the few that finally ended the whole journey, the the, the whole circumnavigation of the world. Uh, I, I want to to just to recall um, the beginning of this uh, incredible journey. The beginning started in Spain uh, in San Lucas de Barrameda. And uh, the expedition uh, sponsored by the Spanish crown was uh, um, made of five big ships, at that time big ships, today won't be considered big ships, but at that time were big ships, five big ships and about 250 sailors or people. Three years later, three years later, one out of these five ships arrived and made the circumnavigation of the world, the first circumnavigation of the world. Pigafetta was one of the 18 out of 250 people that started the expedition who finally succeeded in arriving. And he wrote this uh, chronicle, which is, uh, I think, a very interesting historical document, to which all people that were interested in, in history and did particular history, we, we always focus on where we read it. So uh, my narrative, I said, will be focused on this uh, on these uh, facts that he mentioned. And in addition, we have another document, which is uh, important, which is the, the document made by Francisco de Arbo, who was, again, one of those sailors that were in the expedition that finally succeeded and arrived to Spain three years later, made in, making part of the group of the team that made the first second navigation of history of mankind. Francisco Arbo was Greek. That reminds us that the expedition, and it was sponsored and carried out by Spain, uh, was a multinational expedition uh, made of uh, different nationalities from Europe, even Enrique Malaca, who was, of course, from that area of the world. It was an international and multinational, I would say, expedition. Francisco de Arbo, was in charge of pointing and writing down the coordinates uh, of the trip. And thanks to him, we can know exactly where this uh, expedition was stopping by through this long journey. And thanks to technology uh, nowadays, if we mix, as uh, some investigators in Spain had done, if we mix this document of Francisco de Arbo with the coordinates with a, a Google Maps or Google Earth um, application, we can trace perfectly and exactly the route that uh, Magellan and his expeditioners made. Um, I want to recall one thing, which is the arrival. I want to focus on that. And um, in that sense, just remind that 500 years ago, on March 16th, three, three, three ships of the expedition arrived to what later was called the Philippines. That arrival was not an easy arrival, nor was a, an easy uh, uh, landfall. It was not uh, uh, an easy um, event in the sense that 
that was just after sailing the whole Pacific Ocean. So that was a very important, I think, part of the trip that we have to mention. This expedition led by Magellan and his expeditioners, they were the first one to sail the whole Pacific Ocean that at that time was not called Pacific Ocean. In fact, it was Magellan Expedition who baptized in a way or named the Pacific Ocean with that name. The, that sea was called at that time because also another Spanish um, conquistador, let's say, uh, from, uh, from Spain in Panama, who was the one, Vasco de Gama, who was, uh, sorry, Vasco de Gama, Núñez de Balboa, Núñez de Balboa was the one who saw a name, the Pacific Ocean with the name of Sea of the South, Mar del Sur. All historians, all geographic um, experts at that time, they thought that that sea was much smaller than it was at the end. So it was the expedition of Magellan traversing the, the ocean throughout 100 days of sailing who discovered and baptized the Pacific Ocean, but discovered the size, the incredible size of that part of the earth, which represents about 33%, one third of the surface of the planet, our only planet. So I think to focus and to contextualize the arrival to the Philippines just after the uh, navigation is important. Why? Because the state of mood or, or the, the, I mean, the situation of, of, of the um, sailors, expeditioners, uh, with Magellan heading that, that group of people with these three ships, because one of them has turned back uh, in South America, and the other one was uh, ruined or sh uh, shunken in the uh, Magellan Strait in, in South America. These three ships arrived starving and um, lacking of food, um, fresh water. So their, their physical state was very complicated. They arrived, as I said, to the coast of Eastern Samar, they saw that it was very rocky, difficult. They sailed a little bit to the south and they stopped and anchored in a small island called Sulan. In Sulan, they didn't uh, step down, they stayed in the boats, but then they moved to Homonghon. And they arrived to Homonghon, that bigger island, but in the same area, on the 17th of March, 2021, uh, just 500 years ago, as I said. And then they, they did the landfall. And when they were just um, enjoying the fresh water they got from a fresh spring in, in that island, that island, in fact, was an inhabited island, a sacred island at that time. No, no, no people were uh, living in this island. But then suddenly, and that's the, the main point I want to highlight, suddenly a small boat, suppose a banca or something like that, arrived with about seven, eight men to Homohon. These people from Suluan saw the ships, they followed them, they arrived to Homohon, and that was the first human touch human encounter between the Spanish expedition and the uh, later or so-called Filipinos, the natives, the people that are living in that land. This encounter um, was very fruitful and shown what I want to underline and, and we did together with the uh, Philippine authorities in this commemoration, the humanity, the compassion, the friendship, of the Filipinos, uh, because they helped the Spanish uh, and Magellan and his crew with food, even with coconut liquor, um, uh, with chicken, uh, with fish. So they helped them and they saved them. So that first encounter 500 years ago in Homohon was the first human touch, and that was positive 
constructive, fruitful, and we have to celebrate that. Uh, that's my, my highlight uh, in this commemoration. Of course, we think that the rest of the trip was very interesting. Many things happened. Everybody knows the victory of Mactan for the Filipinos, Tatu Raja Lapu-Lapu killed Magellan, and that provoked many things, uh, a real turn of events, because the expedition, and we have to recall the expedition was not, not a colonizer expedition at that, at that time. At that time was a trade mission, trade mission to find the Spice Islands in the Muluk Islands that were in the Portuguese area, according to many, but was not sure, and that the idea of Magellan was let's sail through the Spices Islands, the Molucca Islands, the Moluccas, through the West, which was a courageous bet that uh, received the sponsor and the support of the Spanish crown at that time. We're talking about 500 years ago, so it's, imp it's interesting to, to try to imagine how things were at that time. Uh, how difficult was the sailing and the conditions and everything. So first touch in Eastern Samar in Homokon was very positive. Then the, the Sulu, Suluan natives that they met in Homohon told Magellan um, to go to Limasawa. Limasawa, as you know, is a small, a beautiful island in southern Leyte. And um, they did it. They went, um, when they recovered, they went to, to Limasawa, and then they met um, the Raja at the time of that island. Uh, last week, I've been in Limasawa. I had the chance to be there. I was with the mayor. I visited the, the shrine, the cross, the historical marker that commemorates that important event. Because in Limasawa took place the first mass with Filipinos. So we can say that this is the start of Christianism in the Philippines took place in that small, beautiful island that I visited just the last weekend. And I can tell you, to those who you don't know, that is a marvelous, a paradisic uh, island, always very exposed to the typhoons. Um, but I, I have I have to tell you that it was amazing and, and impressive, the beauty of, of that island. And I'm trying to imagine what the Spanish expeditioners and the Portuguese and the, all the crew experienced when they landed there. And there was the Datu, or the, the Raja of Limasawa. I mean, the mayor told me that the name of from Limasawa means uh, five wives. And the fact is that, according to historians, the Raja of uh, Colombo, I think he was his name, had five wives. So that's the name of the origin of the etymology of the name of, of Limasawa, five wives, which is, I think, interesting to, to recall. So the Datu, the five wives Datu from Limasawa told Magellan to go to Cebu because Cebu was already a trade spot or hub in that area. And if his will was to find the way to the Spice Islands, he will help him. Yes, so there was Umabon. And it's what Magellan and their expeditioners did. They went with the Datu who served as a guide to arrive to, um, to, to Cebu. They, they arrived to Cebu. They met uh, the Raja uh, Humabon. They baptized his wife, Juana, first baptism in history in the Philippines, according to the National Historical Commission and everybody. They brought the Santo Niño de Cebu. And Magellan committed, according to my humble opinion, a mistake. He was so involved in this agreement with uh, Datu Humabon. They got an agreement, they got a treaty, they got a commitment of um, working together. But why? Magellan was so involved 
on the demands of Kumabon. Because Kumabon asked for help to fight another Datu, another Raja of a small island called Maktan, just in front of Peru. And normally Magellan was not involved on that. He was focused on his mission, trade mission. But according to many, some historians, and I will say my personal opinion, going to the primary sources, and these primary sources, there is a document that I, I think is very important, which is Capitulaciones de Valladolid. That Capitulaciones de Valladolid was a document signed by the Crown and Magellan as a contract for the mission. And according to this text, that I want to share it, and I not now, but I want to bring it at least a facsimile to a coming exhibition that we're going to do. According to the text, there was agreement that Magellan, the Capitan General, could get over the, the sixth island, the sixth, the, the first fifth islands that he will find that will go for the king. Just saying in very raw and very basic words, the six who go to him. So that can explain why Magellan was so involved and committed with Humabon and his agreement in order to help him and to be involved in a battle with a local chief like uh, Lapu Lapu. But this is another story. I just wanted to mention because I think it's, it's interesting. And then Magellan, as I said, uh, died uh, in the victory of Mactan, as, as the Filipino authorities and historians call it. It was a victory for him, but it was a defeat for Magellan, of course. And then that made a turning of events of the whole expedition, because a new command took place in the expedition. And that's why I want to underline one of the important things of this uh, uh, incredible journey is the role of Juan Sebastián Elcano. Many people think that Magellan made the first circumnavigation of the world, which is not true, because he died in the middle of the trip in Mactan. So was this Spanish Basque sailor called Juan Sebastián Elcano, who took command after some events of the expedition, and with just one ship out of five, and with only 18 sailors, managed to arrive to Spain again and did the first circumnavigation of the world. He could do other things. He could go back the same way to Spain with all the spices in the ship, but he decided to sail through the Portuguese waters at that time, which was quite dangerous uh, because uh, we were enemies on the seas, Spain and Portugal. But he was very bold and very courageous, and he did with this tiny small boat, now Victoria, this incredible sailing, till the south of Africa, Cape Town, and then back up to Cabo, Cape Verde, and Cabo Verde, and then to San Lucar de Barrameda again, three years later. And that all that happened 500 years ago. So um, how we commemorate, how we celebrate, how this uh, affects the uh, diplomatic relations, uh, bilateral relations between, between Spain and the Philippines. Well, we've been working together with the uh, Philippine authorities and especially with the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and its chairman, René Escalante. And we endorse and support uh, the idea of establishing the route of Magellan Elcano route in the Philippines in accordance to the whole event of the first circumnavigation of the world. So focus on the Philippines. And the Philippine authorities establish a map, a real map of the route that now everybody can know. And before, to tell the truth, this route was not clearly established. Now it's established, and each place where the expedition stopped by 
there is a historical marker. Very nice historical marker with the words of Pigafetta explaining what happened 500 years ago and uh, with uh, the seal of the Philippines, of course, and on the top, you have the world, the globe, our only planet. So uh, we've been working with them. Uh, I had the chance uh, to be in the very same place, the very same day on the 16th and on the 17th, 500 years ago, where the expedition arrived 500 years ago. And we did it um, together with the Spanish uh, training ship called Juan Sebastián Alcano, who made that tour 500 years after, the same. But it was very nice and very impressive, I have to tell you, to be in Suruan or in Homohon the same day, 500 years later, with the training ship there, with the authorities, and bearing the historical markers that stay from now on forever, which is something that I appreciate, and I think we have to, to bear in mind. Many things happen after that. Uh, we can talk a lot about that. I won't do it because it, it will last too much, but just say that that trip, that experience changed many things. Geography, as I said, with the discovery and the selling of the Pacific Ocean. Um, religion, the spiritual factor that was the origin of the arrival of the establishment of Christianism in the Philippines. I just want to recall that the Philippines is the largest Christian and Catholic country in Asia. Uh, and everything started there. Uh, communications, navigation, not only because of the knowledge that they brought for navigation. But afterwards, we had the uh, Manila Galleon that lasted 250 years of communication, making Manila as a hub, um, a trade hub between three continents, Asia, connected with Chinese commodities, Latin America with uh, Acapulco, at that time called Nueva España, was a province in a way of Spain, Spanish Empire at that time. And from where, uh, Veracruz, on the Caribbean side of, of uh, Mexico, to Spain. This communication lasted 250 years, which is a lot. And many Filipinos were involved in that experience. The sailors, even engineers. At the beginning, the galleon were build, was built in Spain and brought here to do that. But then the galleon started to be built in, in the source of, of Cavite. In Cavite now, we're still listening Chavacano, language that is so very similar to Spanish. So there was a culture and knowledge uh, that started 500 years ago and is related with navigation, communication, of course, architecture, um, civil engineering, and many other factors. But let's say that we keep on uh, from the Spanish embassy, we keep on um, uh, commemorating um, that important event that I think is, is, is deeply rooted in the Philippine history and the Spanish, of course. But um, we'll, we'll do some beautiful things, I think. I don't know if we're going to be as, as uh, productive and intensive uh, as, as Cookie Feria in Portugal, because she's been doing a great work. I have to admit I'm astonished and impressed. Um, but we'll do our best bringing here an exhibition, Spanish exhibition called The uh, Longest Journey. It was inaugurated in Seville, in Archivo General de Indias by the King and Queen of Spain. And we'll bring it here and with the help and uh, uh, cooperation and collaboration of the National Historic, uh, uh, the, the National Museum of the Philippines and, and his, his uh, <laughs> director is uh, just here in the screen. Uh, we're going to set this exhibition in the Philippines in Manila in the coming months. So we're working on that and we'll, we'll try to, to bring the best and to, to show and commemorate together with our friends, the Filipinos, um, this uh, uh, turn of events that was the first circumnavigation, especially the Philippine part of that trip 
500 years ago. So uh, as a historian once told me, um, we are not responsible of what our directly responsible of what our, our ancestors did in the past. But we are responsible to remember what they did and how they did. So uh, I'm carrying that responsibility uh, humbly and trying to commemorate and, and remember what happened 500 years ago together here with my friend, Filipino friends in, in this country so close to me and, and so close to, to Spain. So maraming salamat o, and thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, señor embajador. That was uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, and having been with you on several of these occasions to commemorate the quincentennial, uh, you have always been able to bring to life the events, no? Uh, just as you have this this afternoon about the journey um, viaje mas largo and the encounters in the philippines it was my something i will never forget to be ha, being able to be with you in homonjon on exactly the same day 500 years later uh where the landing took place and where they took water and yeah uh, it's unforgettable thank you very much um ambassador Ho Jorge Morales Sanchez, as always. Uh, he did mention a forthcoming collaboration with us at the National Museum uh, of an exhibition adapted from one inaugurated in Sevilla, uh, in Spain. And so everyone, uh, please look forward to that. The museum just reopened, museums in Manila just reopened yesterday. Um, uh, and uh, and so things should be easier moving forward. Speaking of exhibitions, may I also announce that just earlier, the Quincentennial Art Exhibition was inaugurated at SM Aura premiere in Taguig. Uh, that is only going to be up for a few days. Uh, that's part of the annual Manila Art uh, uh, program of NCCA. And it opens today until Sunday, October 24. So if you'd like to see the winners of the Quincentennial Art Competition, including the beautiful painting that is featured on the Portuguese stamps, very impressive, um, please check that out uh, while it's there. All right, well, we, um, unfortunately, I've been notified by the organizers that Ambassador Luilier in Madrid won't be able to join us anymore. So we have our three, uh, uh, uh persons present uh from lisbon jakarta and here in manila um and we are now open for um for questions uh and a short discussion we have um about uh 10 10 or so minutes for that um i've been scrutinizing the facebook comments on the main facebook page i know there are many facebook pages i don't see too many questions here, but there are some comments. First of all, everyone, so many people are thanking uh, the, the four panelists today um, for uh, their presentations. Mabuhay po kayo, uh, many are saying. Um, I think for many people, it's the first time to hear uh, from, from all four. Uh, and, um, and so yes, let me convey the gratitude of many people here. Some of the comments are, okay, we're celebrating this quincentennial, and it's a worldwide celebration because it does go around the whole world. Um, what is next? Uh, will what will be the legacy of the commemoration? No, so um, uh, between our countries of Spain and Portugal, Philippines, and others, um, what do you the th the three? Uh, uh, ambassadors and, and deputy chief of mission. Um, what, what can you comment on as seeing the legacy of the quincentennial celebration for all our country, for our respective countries? Uh, will it bring us closer together? Will it bring cooperation and uh, sense of uh, uh, brotherhood and, and you know, ties closer than ever before? Um, ladies first, may I start with you, Ambassador Feria? I, I knew that was coming, Jeremy. So. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, what um, I think this whole Quincentennial celebration is like a restart button for us. Um, okay. A lot of things have happened um, during this year and what and leading to the Quincentennial. I say a reset button because finally, you know, all these stories, all these histories, all these efforts to 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 read. And to and research have 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 all come out, and um, it's a great opportunity for us to to take take advantage of what's coming out there, the works that we're doing in Lisbon, what the embassy in Madrid is doing, what the embassies of Portugal and Spain are doing. Um, all of this is to bring our narratives, our respective narratives, into this commemoration, um, and um, I, I think. Um, what we've done here is using the quincentennial celebration to tell our stories in Portugal. And, and for that, we're very, very lucky that we have this quincentennial activity. So we're able to, to, to use this opportunity to tell our stories, to tell the Philippine stories here. There is a Philippine part to this quincentennial, and it was very important because um, it, it was where Magellan died. And so it changes the story of the of this whole commemoration and it it, it um emphasizes that it's a it's a spanish expedition no doubt we've never nobody has said that it wasn't it's just that it was led by a portuguese um, navigator and yes he sailed for spain and and i think in my in my presentation i sort of like um, simplified it by saying it's like a, a startup. You know, you have an idea, you present it to a, a, a venture capitalist. One said yes, one said no. And, and the one who said yes, well, then it continued. The journey continued. And so that's how um, important this whole um, celebration is. Fantastic. Yeah. Great answer, Madam Ambassador. Um, a, re, a restart button indeed, and especially more meaningful as we restart may, perhaps having gone through the worst of the global pandemic as well and the economic health crisis, uh, climate change crisis. Um, yeah, so that's a, a wider context for, for this. Um, may I may I ask you the same question, or please invite you to give your impressions, Senor Bernardes Joaquim? What's next in your view uh, for all of us? Um, you know, having done our best or doing our best to have a meaningful, inclusive uh, uh, commemoration. Well, first of all, I, I hope uh, uh, that this renewed interest in our common past remains very much alive. Uh, the commemorations uh, were uh, a good way of uh, um, mobilizing attention from uh, probably even the youth who had uh, never uh, um, heard, but not even the, just the youth. Uh, let's be honest, this is a polyphonic process. We were aware of that. There's a lot of historiography about uh, the circumnavigation trip and all the centuries uh, afterwards. But uh, um, uh, they, they didn't meet each other. So basically, uh, uh, or they met uh, um, in um, uh, a fora that were only uh, for the, the specialists. And we hope that somehow this becomes a wider process, a wider and polyphonic process, and that the attention brought out uh, by, by the commemorations remains alive, that the, all these people that are gathered today uh, um, before I, I had heard that, that this is the, the biggest uh, uh, convention uh, uh, in the history of the Philippines that has gathered or, or the, the attention of thousands of people. This is great. This is indeed what the commemorations brought of new, and this is what we want next. We want that this attention doesn't die, that it remains alive, and that it also serves as an inspiration for us to keep doing new things. As I said, there are familiar concepts, but uh, uh, they shouldn't be uh, an excuse for us to relive the past. That's impossible. Uh, we should build on uh, those concepts into the future. I hope that's what comes next. Yes, indeed. Thank, thank you very much. And as uh, hopefully restrictions will permanently ease, we hope to see more of you and your colleagues from Jakarta uh, here in the Philippines so that we can 
discuss more. Certainly, um, I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a very, it, it's the start of a more intensive uh, appreciation, um, Philippines and Portugal, not least because of our ambassador in Lisbon. Um, and I also wanted to take just a quick moment just to mention uh, the Consul General at Honorum of Portugal, Antonio Rufino, who did so much to promote uh, Portuguese uh, uh, shared heritage with the Philippines. He, of course, passed away earlier this year. Um, and, uh, and so for me and my colleagues in the cultural government agencies, um, it would be great uh, to have more engagement moving forward uh, with our Portuguese friends. Um, and to you, Ambassador Moragas, uh, so what's next for you? You, you're, you always, you, you do think ahead, you do, uh, you know, you do have an appreciation of, of what the opportunities are to build on as after this centennial maybe is, is, is over. Uh, some comments, please, sir. Well, you, 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 you mentioned the idea of legacy. Uh, what's the legacy of the commemoration and what's next? No. Okay. Uh, I, I, I will be, I will mention as a legacy, uh, something that I, I mentioned before, because it's a tangible legacy is all these historical markers that have been set in this road to Miguel and Elcano um, are tangible. I mean, you can see it. Uh, you can uh, you can go to those places. You you can trace it in in, in in your internet. You can sail. You can repeat that. So the historical markers with these old explanations is something that is tangible that will stay here forever. So um, that's a, a point, and it's not my. Um, I have not done, done that. It's a, it's, a, it's a Filipino contribution uh, by the uh, National Historical Commission. So I appreciate, I love the initiative. We sponsor that. We have um, um, we built also and sponsor one of the historical markets uh, to be written in Spanish. At least we have some legacy um, in, in Giwan, in, Giwan in, in Eastern Samar. And in addition, we have all the things. For instance, next October 29th, the third bridge between Cebu and Cordoba in Mactan is gonna be finished. That third bridge, which is also a tangible infrastructure that connects Mactan and Cebu, which is interesting from the historical point of view, is built, as, as um, you may know, by a Spanish company, Acciona, together with uh, Metro Pacific, uh, another, another Philippine, a very important company. So uh, it's what is next for me. I mean, I, ha I have to go, and, and I'm glad to go uh, next weekend to Cebu in order to witness and to honor this ending and connection, because it's going to be a physical connection of this bridge built by Spanish together with Filipinos between Mactan, where Magellan died, and Cebu. So I know that it's a tiny thing, but it's a, something which is next, which is connected with the idea of, uh, of the legacy, and that shows, in addition, the very infrastructure, a bridge, is a connection element. So the connecting element uh, between two parts of land, two islands, serves to stress the, or to highlight the idea of connection between human beings, peoples, nations, in that case, between the Philippines and Spain, is, is my, my, my approach. And, and yeah. that goes back to many things that happen in history that will be remembered in the coming years because the colonization of Spain in the Philippines started later. So there will be more 500 years to commemorate <laughs> for the good or for the bad. But I will focus on one idea that happened 500 years ago as well, which was the the culture 
of agreement, the culture of treaties, the Sandugo, the blood agreements that took place here um, 500 years ago or less. Um, and that's, uh, you know, uh, Director Barnes, that now is also has an a, a, a expressive and aesthetical, beautiful expression in a work of art of uh, Juan de Luna, no? So sí, sí. the idea of Sandugo, the idea of agreements, treaties, connection, I think has to be the legacy for the next 500 years. So that's my... Yes, yes, indeed, uh, Ambassador. Um, I, I let me, th you know, uh, take the opportunity to thank you for the embassy and your strong support of all the activities this year, um, so far of the quincentennial celebration. Your presence at some of these has made everything more, you know, very meaningful to the communities. And as for the bridge, well, I was in Cebu recently and it's extremely impressive. I think you will enjoy very much the completion next week. Everyone is excited about it in Cebu. And it is quite a symbol, as, as you've said. No? Um, well, I have to wrap up soon. We we're, uh, we're, uh, have hit our time. I, let me just read through some of the questions um, that are in the Zoom chat. I'm not gonna ask for an answer. But just to share with everyone uh, what is the thinking, because I think uh, the presentations today have provoked um, provoked a lot of thoughts among our attendees. I see attendees from Ilocos, from Lanao, from all over the country. Um, so people are thinking that uh, you know, if ever our historical narratives regarding the Magellan's arrival will be revisited. How will these be accepted in a global perspective? So that's a good question um, that many people are thinking about. Uh, people are talking about, yes, um, whether this will be the start or the impetus for closer collaboration. I think that has been answered. Um, to Ambassador Feria, there, people are really interested in the Philippine-Portugal uh, Portuguese bilateral relationship. So perhaps in future activities, uh, we can ask you to to talk more about it. Of course, because port, you know our relationship with Portugal is is probably not as well known as our relationship with Spain and other countries. Um, but certainly something that is in, so interesting to many people. Um, there's also other questions here. Uh, interest in the Santo Nino. Um, being considered as the greatest gift of Magellan. Um, it's asking actually why. I think the answer is clear. It's because the Filipinos themselves embraced the image of the Holy Child and made it something very special to ourselves. You know? So it wasn't maybe intended as a great gift, but it's something that Filipinos have embraced as a legacy of that encounter. Um, yes, so please, please. I can just because I saw it in the thing, and just to clarify, the reason why we say it because it Magellan personally gifted um, the wife of Raja Humaban with the Santo Nino. Indeed, she, yes. She was made to choose. If if you read on the um, the chronicles of uh, of Pigafetta, it would show, and of course the uh, like I said, the book of uh, the book of um, of uh, Dani and of Verona, Ferdinand Magellan. It's all there. Um, it mm -hmm. was. Was made to uh, he, uh, they were they presented three statues to the wife of Pumabon, and she chose the Santo Nino because it was the first time that they had actually seen a a, a child that was a god, um, and so she was fascinated by it, and 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 that's how this Santo Nino tradition started in Cebu, and that's why we say that that's actually one of the legacies of Magellan in 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 the Philippines is that the fact that. He gave the statue to to to, um, to 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 the Queen Juana, and again, I go back to saying it is a Spanish expedition. So all these things of Christianity really came from Spain, not from Portugal. It's just that it's the person of Magellan, and and what our stories here, what we're saying is we're taking apart history, taking Magellan away from that bigger story and analyzing him because that's the Portuguese connection in all of this. So I, yes. I hope. I 
I hope we're, we, we've, we've um, clarified how Portugal is involved in, in at least the embassy's um, activities involving Portugal is involved in this quincentennial celebration. Yes, very much so. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, um, for for uh, yeah, for for giving us more of your insight. There is a question that was addressed to Senor Bernardes Joaquim as how significant this is to relate bilateral relations between Philippines and Portugal. I think you answered that already, sir, by saying that it it is it prompts really uh, you know a deeper look, more polyphonic, as you said. Uh, meaning on on different levels between different uh, uh, sectors, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that's been answered. Um, and then there's also concerns for you know people who feel globalization is be is being reversed. Is go there's more protectionism, more nationalism, you no, know? um, and that perhaps. The commem this quincentennial commemoration of a circumnavigation can remind, you know, remind people uh, that globalization uh, is a good thing and may, you know, and may, you know, bring us all back onto that program of closer integration regionally, interregionally, globally. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave that there. Um, why is Magellan credited with the first circumnavigation when he died? Well, yes, uh, you're quite right. Um, it's his expedition that he led uh, that is credited, not the man himself, though he, he did spend time apparently in the Portuguese uh, controlled islands of Indonesia. So in a sense, he did on two voyages, you know, basically go around the world. Uh, but not on the single one that we are celebrating, no, that came from Spain and un under South America. Um, yeah. So we really credit uh, these days the Magallanes Elcano expedition. Magallanes started it and led most of the first part. And there were a couple of changes of leadership uh, after Mactan, but then Elcano took over and did and finish the, the rest. So that's how we more accurately phrase it. No? Uh, why do we think he landed in Cebu and not somewhere else? Well, because uh, the, chroni the, the chronicles uh, of Pigafetta and others make it quite clear that uh, the route that we have been talking about, uh, from Samar, uh, uh, Suloan, Homon Hong, Masawa, uh, is indeed what happened, no? and uh, and so on and so forth. So more more questions. Some quite critically thought. Uh, some some simple to answer, but I think we're out of time. Um, for me to wrap up, it's basically uh, to, starting with Ambassador Louillier. He talked about how he feels the circumnavigation really led to the to a cultural uh, commercial exchanges, of course, um, most famously the galleon trade, uh, and how that has led to all kinds of aspects of how Filipinos are today. Uh, he talked about several interesting uh, activities that will go on in Madrid and elsewhere in Spain. Unfortunately, he wasn't here to, to extend his remarks, but I hope to see him again. Um, and stay tuned for what is happening in Spain through the efforts of our friends at the Philippine Embassy. Uh, of course, Ambassador Feria gave a very, very substantive uh, presentation. Um, I hope that presentation will be accessible. Uh, very many exciting things. As a, uh, as a museum director, I'm very excited about the three legacy projects, you know, the um, uh, Philippines and Portuguese histor historiography, the es historical essays compiled uh, in, in, in a new book, and then, of course, knowing what is in the Portuguese archives. No? Um, so th that's very exciting for someone like me and many others, I'm sure, who are here. Uh, Senor Emanuel Bernardes Joaquim, who's uh, someone new to many of us, it was great to have you, sir. Uh, uh, talk, gave us his insights you know, on, uh, on, again, on how this will in, intensify um, mutual awareness, appreciation, engagement uh, between our two countries, um, which will enrich, you know, all of us. 
And uh, of course, um, uh, Ambassador Moragas um, gave more, you know, brought to, chose his time to, to, in his time to bring more to life the the actual events, you know, that we, uh, he and I and many others have been privileged to commemorate in their sites, you know, uh, this quincentennial year. So I hope I've done justice um, to the panel. Uh, thank you for allowing me to bring out a few more things. Thank you to our audience for your questions. There's never enough time, uh, of course, to, to address each and every one. I hope our audience is happy enough with the insights that we've brought out today. So now all that remains is for me to thank you, dear, uh, dear ambassadors. Uh, thank you very much for your participation and support of this activity. We wish you all the, all the best of luck um, in your various endeavors related to this commemoration. Uh, it seems that there's so much support um, from every angle, the four corners of this, the Philippines and Spain and Portugal, Portugal in the Philippines, Spain in the Philippines. So all the angles um, are well covered. We have a great appreciation of how together um, our three countries represented in this discussion uh, uh, will really seek to maximize and promote a meaningful um, uh, outcome from the 500 years of the first circumnavigation of the globe. So thank you very much. Uh, again, um, I have to find my código here. Muito obrigado. Muchas gracias. Marame pong salamat sa inyong lahat. With that, we now end this panel of the inaugural session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. Uh, it is now seven o'clock here in Manila. We invite everyone to catch the second panel of the inaugural session tomorrow, Thursday, October 21, 9 a.m. Philippine time to 12 noon. It has the theme, Southeast Asia views the quincentennial. Uh, so um, it's flashed now uh, on the screen. So please join us in the Zoom for that panel on a first come first serve basis, registering at the National Quincentennial Committee website, nqc.gov.ph backslash PIGC. So I have had the honor and pleasure of being the moderator for our panelists and our vast audience today. I'm Jeremy Barnes uh, of the National Museum of the Philippines. Again, thank you. Muito obrigado. Muchísimas gracias. And have a great day. Stay safe, everyone.